Warm welcome to everyone, but before starting, I would like to introduce Scott Morris, Senior Fellow and Director of the U.S. Development Policy Initiative here at CGD to make a few remarks. As Scott comes forward, I'd, I'd just like to add that uh, our thanks to Scott for all the support you've given to us as we prepare for the, uh, uh, this AGM, and thank you again for enabling us to have this wonderful conference facility for our uh, meeting. So thanks to you and the whole CGD team have been great to work with. So thanks a lot. Um, well, thanks very much, Carol. Um, I simply want to provide our welcome and greeting, be very brief, um, and to say that we really uh, value the relationship we have with your organization. Um, I was uh, thinking this morning, we this year launched uh, a speaker series called Voices of Experience on the very premise that alumni have something useful to say. Um, so I'm particularly pleased that you'll have Ambassador Green here this afternoon. You'll hear from him, but even more importantly, he'll hear from you. Um, so best wishes for that. I'll be joining you later this afternoon. Looking forward to a panel at the end of the afternoon. And um, enjoy. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Uh, again, welcome to everyone. We're delighted that you all are here. And the you uh, does include a number of specially invited guests, including uh, young professionals from USAID who will join us for much of the day. I'm not sure how many are here already, but they should be identifiable as being much younger than the, <laughs> the rest of us. So. Um, be because the AGM is a business meeting, we would like to take a, a few minutes to report back to the, to the members. But before doing that, we would like to remind all of you that the success of the UAA depends upon the active involvement and work of its members. We need more people to become actively involved, and especially the next generation of you say retirees, and that means people with less uh, white hair than some of us. We need more people to become actively involved. Um, and again, we plead uh, for you to do that. Please consider stepping up to uh, help build a sustainable USAID Alumni Association. That certainly will be a major focus of the, of the executive committee over the coming years, so I'm sure you will hear more about it uh, during the year. Now, we would like to highlight some of the accomplishments over the past year. Announcements of the AGM did include a link to the UAA website and a formal report that details 2017 activities and preliminary 2018 plans. If you haven't already done so, please read the report and provide us with your thoughts on future priorities. In addition, we will send out a separate survey in early January asking for your views. Once we hear from you, final 2018 plans uh, and uh, budget will be put in place. We think you will be impressed by the progress in 2017, including the continued increase in membership. As of October 30th, there were nearly 1,000 registered alumni and 370 plus contributing members. While the increases are impressive over the last couple of years, there is still plenty of room for growth, so please continue to reach out to former USAID employees to join the UAA. Regarding contributions, we would like to thank many of you for listening to our plea last year to make your 2017 contributions during the first two months of the year. This greatly facilitated our planning and cash flow. We will remind you again in January when we send out the announcement for 2018 contributions. We thank all of the committee members who made 2017 so successful. As I noted earlier, please find ways to work with the various committees so we can further build and sustain the UAA. Now to just a very brief summary of highlights. The Strengthening USAID Committee worked with USAID to continue implementing the mentorship program, which pairs USAID alumni volunteers with uh, officers serving in USAID missions. 38 mentor-mentee relationships were active in 2017, 31 new pairs, and seven continuing from earlier cohorts. Recruitment for cohort 
number seven has begun and more mentors are needed. Please see Jerry Wood, Jose Garzon, John Hurd, or David Cohen to become a mentor or committee member. And again, more mentors are needed, so please volunteer. The Development Issues Committee organized an array of interesting presentations and discussions on international development at its bi-monthly committee meetings and at the Development Dialogue Series at Dacor House. The committee's perspective section on the website has continued to enable members to submit short essays and comment on development issues. And the committee also organized a number of book group sessions that were well attended. And please see Jim Fox or Steve Giddings to join this committee. The membership committee, as noted earlier, continued to bring new members to the UAA, as well as reaching out to alumni in other parts of the country and sp sponsoring social activities during the year and sponsoring the annual alumni award. They have all also led outreach to the membership uh, through the annual survey and brought your views to the executive committee. Please see uh, Nancy Tumovic, Carol Dabbs, or other committee members with ideas on further expanding membership, including of former FSNs and non-Foreign Service alumni. The Public Outreach Committee has continued to liaise with USAID and other organizations to identify opportunities for alumni to speak about development and foreign assistance. The committee has had successes, but it does need new members and new leadership to increase its impact. Please consider volunteering to help reinvigorate this committee's mandate. Beyond public outreach per se, the committee, or more accurately, John Peelmeyer, has continued to update the bibliography of USAID authors and to provide opportunities for authors to, represent, uh, to present at UAA-sponsored events. The bibliography now has 218 titles, and check it out on the UAA website. We also continue to collaborate with the Association of Diplomatic Training and Studies, including the expansion of oral histories of former USAID officers under a grant from USAID to ADST, 30 new oral histories have been completed or, or are underway all during the last 12 months. The Finance and Administration Committee has continued to strengthen UAA systems, including management of legal reporting uh, requirements. David Cohen continues to upgrade the quality of materials on the website. Ven Suresh continues as our part-time admin assistant and I hope all of you will have a chance to thank Ben at some point today for the great work that he does. And please see George Hill or Rob Sonenthal if you would like to volunteer to help with that committee. And I know that David Cohen would appreciate any help that any of you would provide on uh, helping with the, uh, with the website. Finally, the USAID History Committee has made great progress in securing funding and getting started on publication of an independent history of USAID. Thanks to 124 UAA donors thus far, we have $186,000 in the bank, and work has begun. John Norris will be the author of the work, uh, and uh, he will work as a, as a non-resident fellow here at the Center for Global Development. An advisory committee has been established and contracts have been signed. Alex Shackow chairs this committee. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, the History Project, please see Alex during the day. I should also add that our fundraising efforts continue. We would like to see as much UAA participation as possible. About half of the members in this room have already contributed to the History Project. But that means half have not. <laughs> so uh, please consider doing so. Uh, this is an important group enterprise, and we want and need maximum participation. There is information in the handouts uh, you received on how you can make your donation to the project. Uh, and I am looking because one of the things I'm supposed to do is to introduce John Norris, but I don't. Uh, right, I was going to be introducing John Norris so he could say just a couple of words, but let me uh, 
Perhaps we'll have a chance later in the day to be able to do that. But in case uh, you all aren't aware of who John is, he is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. And his um, prior experience in international development includes being a member of President uh, Obama's Devel uh, Global Development Council. Oh, OK. John, I am. Oh, you have been. OK. I have been. Uh, John, you should be coming up. Because uh, given time, time constraints, we only can let you chat for a minute or a couple of minutes. But we do want to uh, have everyone have a chance to see you. So as I was introducing, John has had senior jobs in, in uh, the UN State Department, international NGOs. Many of you remember John as a USAID communications director in the 90s. He's also worked on the Hill. And perhaps most importantly, he is a published author. And many of you may have read the piece he did for DevEx on former USAID administrators uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, which was a wonderful piece. So we feel very lucky to have John. And so John, if you'd like to say a few words, thank you. Thank you, Carol, and uh, apologies for wandering in a bit late. Uh, I'll keep my comments very brief. I'm just uh, very excited to be working on this. Obviously, it's uh, um, an enormous job in a lot of ways. Uh, as an author, you always worry that you're not going to have enough material. And this is a case where uh, my greatest concern is that I have an excess of material. Um, but there's really a compelling story to be told. Um, the stuff that was done around the 50th anniversary provides lots of good resources, as do the oral histories. Uh, but I'm sure I'll be reaching out to many of you along the way uh, to flesh out um, some of these stories and work on it. Uh, and I'm very excited to do this in partnership with all of you. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. We all look forward to uh, uh, to engaging with you and to seeing the final results. So now it's uh, have the pleasure of turning things over to Tish uh, Butler, co-chair of the UAA, who will be in charge. <laughs> Best co-chair ever. <laughs> um, welcome. I'm excited to see so many old friends and, and colleagues, um, youngish old friends and colleagues, <laughs> getting younger all the time. Um, my, I'm introducing the theme of this uh, uh, event today. It's uh, the, the importance of commercial and intellectual partnerships for USAID. And we all know that partnering is not a new concept for USAID. Um, for decades, it has sought partnerships to strengthen local capacity for sustainability and to focus on, to, and to focus on scaling up and, and leveraging private resources. Um, but today, we'll be looking both backwards uh, to focus on what we can learn from USAID's past practices, um, but we'll also look forward to understand how USAID is thinking about partnerships now and their new think. And, um, and that thereby will enable our alumni, you all, uh, to learn a little bit more about current priorities in, in the agency. And to ensure this two-way learning, we've invited a current USAID officer to be on each of the, of the uh, panels. We expect each session to have significant time for Q's and A's and discussion. Um, all of our moderators will seek to make this happen. We have also scheduled substantial time for socializing, including a 30-minute coffee break, I think it's at 11.30, and a lengthy lunch break. Uh, but in order to make sure that we stay on schedule, we do ask everyone to return to the rooms bef after the coffee break before 11.30. And uh, after the lunch break, I think at 2, uh, so we can start our plenary sessions on time. And you'll see from the agenda that we're in plenary here, this room, all day. Um, we'll have two panels in the morning, and immediately after lunch in the afternoon, we'll announce the results of the, of the uh, board elections and the winners of the Alumni of the Year awards. So we are extremely pleased to announce that the USAID Administrator Mark Green will speak to us at 2.30 this afternoon. And to make good use of his very short time, he's here for half an hour, we're asking all of you, if you have questions for the administrator, to write them on three by five cards that are out on the table in the foyer next to our um, other handouts. And we can also get some and pass them around. Um, please write your questions and return the cards to George Ingram, who, or Carol, or myself. George uh, will be. Uh, 
collating the, the questions and, and, and putting them into categories, and he will be with the administrator on the dais uh, when, at that time when he's, uh, the administrator is answering basically your questions. Um, so we'll appreciate your help on this. And at three, we have a star-studded panel on aid reform issues, looking towards what may be coming, with voices from the Hill, with think tanks, and from USAID. So again, our focus today is on partnerships and the future approaches to US foreign assistance. And we look forward to a very substantive, substantive and fun day with all of you. So now I'd like to ask our speakers on the first panel to come forward. Uh, and while they're doing so, I have the honor to introduce the moderator, our friend and colleague, Jim Michael. Uh, I just did. The three by five cards are on the table, and if you, and we'll have some uh, passing them out around during our, our break, too. Um, as most of you know, Jim is a leader in just about every job he's ever had. <laughs> um, as the chair of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD in Paris, uh, assistant administrator, counselor, acting administrator in USAID, held multiple senior positions in the State Department, including ambassador to Guatemala, um, and a great contributor in the U to, the, to the UAA. And we are fortunate to have you moderating this panel. Thank you, Jim. Can we pull this back? Will that cause any harm? Otherwise, it's, I'm afraid, going to block some people's vision. OK, well. Some was, someone's supposed to turn us on, I think, so that you can hear us. Did that happen? No? Uh, I think, are the people in the back, anybody back there going to turn us, turn us on? No? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, that's good. OK, well. <clears throat> As, uh, as Tish uh, Butler just, just said, our theme this morning is on partnership with this first panel looking at uh, partnership with the private sector. Uh, the uh, theme of partnership is one that is, is well known not just to AID but throughout the development community. You can go back to the Pearson Commission in the 1960s, partners in development up to the Sustainable Development Goals, which emphasize a global partnership. And uh, the consensus on the value of partnership as a way to carry out <clears throat> development cooperation extends to an acknowledgement of the central role of the private sector in advancing innovation and growth and job creation and making uh, a big contribution to the overall economic and social development of any, of any country. Uh, principal actors in the private sector for development are in the local private sector, of course, but international business also is an important source of finance, technology, knowledge, and market entry. Uh, in today's multi-stakeholder world, where there are more private actors, there are more international actors of all kinds, and more sources of funding than ever before. Uh, partnerships are more important than ever, and at the same time, the complexity of these relationships makes them more difficult. Uh, there are lots of guides to governing partnership arrangements. The OECD spent two years coming up with principles. Uh, the uh, declaration of the Sustainable Development uh, Summit that produced the Sustainable Development Goals has a list of nine principles on this, and USAID has been doing a lot of work uh, in this country. And USAID, as, as again Tish mentioned, has a long history of partnership, and uh, the, the website speaks of uh, 1,600 alliances and uh, 3,500 partners. So uh, there's a lot of experience there. And how well is aid navigating this complex world? Uh, how has it done so in the past? <clears throat> how does it look to the private sector? And what are the thoughts within USAID for uh, the present and looking forward? 
And we have uh, just the panelists here to address those three aspects of partnership with the private sector. Uh, you have the uh, bios in your handouts, so I won't uh, elaborate on them, but John Sembrello, I think, is well known to many of you as a uh, long-serving uh, uh, USAID uh, mission director and senior official and executive uh, director of the Pan American Development Foundation. Richard Crespin has worked uh, with uh, uh, private, public, uh, civil society uh, relationships and making them work uh, with USAID and with others uh, over his entire career. Uh, Sean Jones, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau of Food Security at USAID, uh, ensures the formation and implementation of some very big multi-party uh, partnerships through the Feed the Future and is, is an expert in other aspects uh, of the partnership work in USAID. So uh, let me uh, get this started by, by asking uh, John Sombrello and asking then each of you in turn uh, to describe the kinds of partnership efforts uh, that you are most familiar with, how you see these efforts fitting into the context of the work of development cooperation and development policy and, and, and what USAID can contribute. And uh, John, starting with, with, with you, uh, can you talk a little bit about the evolving role of private sector development in USAID? Who are the players, what are the programs, and what is the impact of, of this? Yeah, I thought we'd, uh, Michael, I guess I, um, I thought I'd uh, take us all down memory lane a little bit uh, and uh, uh, talk about how deeply rooted uh, partnerships are in uh, USAID history. Uh, I would also argue, some of you have heard my uh, history of foreign assistance, that they're also very deeply uh, uh, rooted in uh, American history and uh, but dating back to even the 19th century. Uh, it's something that, it, uh, that I argue defines the distinctive nature, uh, one of the distinctive natures of U.S. Uh, foreign assistance. Uh, and I uh, came upon all of this and was reminded of this when I first took over the Pan American Development uh, Foundation in the late 1990s and went back and looked at why uh, the Pan American Development Foundation was created in the, in the uh, early 1960s as a sister institution with USAID and the Peace Corps. And it was specifically uh, established uh, by the Organization of American States with support from uh, uh, USAID and others uh, to promote microenterprises, to strengthen civil society, and to promote uh, 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 partnerships with the private sector. Caterpillar being the first company to join at that, at that time. This is the early 1960s, and I've argued since then that the original uh, GDA uh, was uh, the Pan American <laughs> Development Foundation. And uh, so all of this is uh, well established within USAID, an agency approaching 60 years. Uh, and I'm reminded uh, so much of the history in the 1960s, uh, where uh, USAID implemented uh, the Alliance for Progress, uh, the development of what became uh, the Asian Tigers in Taiwan and South Korea. All of this was fundamental, uh, a fundamental part of this was what we now call private sector development or partnerships development. And uh, a key element of it was uh, developing the local private sector, local investment banks, uh, productivity centers, uh, uh, training programs, uh, you even had John Kennedy on the, on the telephone with the Harvard Business School, uh, convincing the Harvard Business School to get involved in Central America uh, and developing what today we know as INCON, the Graduate uh, Business School of, of Central America. Similarly, on the phone to Stanford Business School, uh, uh, convincing them to get involved in Peru uh, and creating... Uh, uh, ISAN, uh, the country's first graduate business school. So there was a different time. A key part of this was the development and a defining iconic uh, 
piece of that period was the development of investment banks. Uh, what in Latin America became financieras, uh, which you say uh, put a great deal of emphasis in, the rationale being uh, developing uh, savings and channeling those, that savings into productive enterprises. And it involved investment bankers from the US uh, and investment bankers from uh, uh, Europe. And uh, a little known organization was created by, with the leadership of J Senator Jacob Javits and Senator Hubert Humphrey uh, and leading multinationals that was called the Atlantic uh, Development Community uh, Investment Group for Latin America, ADELA. And ADELA provided what would later become the enterprise funds, uh, the <laughs> same concept of the enterprise funds in Eastern Europe, uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean, and became an iconic piece of the 1960s. The key point is that private sector was an integral part of mission strategies at that period of time. <clears throat> they weren't anecdotal undertakings. They were a fundamental part. Every mission had them. Every mission uh, had private sector officers. And as you move through uh, the history of USAID in the 70s, uh, even when there was a shift in USAID policy, we came back to private sector development. Uh, the Overseas Private Investment uh, Corporation was really created out of a program, an investment guarantee program that was pioneered by the Latin America Bureau. Uh, the Latin American Agribusiness Development Corporation, uh, regional integration uh, in the 1970s. Uh, the Trade and Development Program uh, created in the 1970s, even where most assistance was government to government at that time, focused on the poor majority. And within the realm of more of our own experiences, the 1980s saw these iconic foundations uh, and groups uh, focused on, uh, on uh, 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 helping countries make the transition from import substitution industrialization to export-led development. And the famous ones were clearly in uh, uh, Central America, Fusadis that many of us worked on, uh, Fide in Honduras, and the other ones, all with involvement from U.S. Uh, investment bankers, uh, U.S. Uh, importers uh, of uh, non-traditional agricultural exporters, uh, e e exports, and uh, and other uh, investors during that period of time. Uh, as the private sector program evolved uh, during the 1990s, the Eastern European program that we talked about uh, uh, drew upon some of this experience. I don't think it drew a lot on, on a lot of it, but it drew on some of this experience. But it, the basic point is private sector has been uh, a fundamental part of USAID programs throughout much of its 60-year <clears throat> history. There are tremendous lessons to be learned from that history. Uh, uh, they have often been controversial. In the late 60s, uh, there was an attempt to sweep the program under the rug because there were charges that only made the rich richer uh, and the poor poor, uh, unfairly so. Uh, and in the 1990s, it encountered <laughs> other types of export processing zones, encountered others. But across the region, across the, the developing world, uh, beyond just the, um, the partnerships that Jim uh, laid out, the recent partnerships over the last 15 years, uh, there are hundreds of institutions from savings and loan associations that Peter Kim has talked about, uh, to uh, the investment banks, to the productivity center, to the training centers, to the graduate business schools, all of which fit within, in most cases, a comprehensive strategic focus that was mission-based with support mechanisms uh, from uh, uh, USAID Washington. I think that history is extremely important. Uh, and uh, all of us and USAID can learn a great deal from that history and the lessons learned. Uh, 
I'll talk more about yeah. that in the second part. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Richard, uh, how does all this look from the private sector side? Uh, John has described a number of programs and we have uh, a bunch more. We have Global Development Alliance, we have a Development Credit Authority, we have a Development Innovation Ventures, we have uh, broad agency announcements that pull in private sector ideas, and we have uh, a lot of other programs uh, that are related uh, with OPIC and TDA and XM and MCC and uh, <laughs> We have multilaterals like the International Finance Corporation and all of these relationships. And uh, you have to figure all this out if you want to do business with, right. with AID mm -hmm. and its role in these complex, often multi-party relationships. How, how does this all look from a private sector yeah, perspective? Yeah, um, so picking kind of up on where John left off, uh, perhaps telling the same history, but from the perspective of the private sector for a second. Um, you know, I teach a class at GW on public-private partnerships, and my graduate students oftentimes think of companies as Johnny-come-latelys to the game of development and to um, social purpose. And one of the first things I try to do is to disabuse them of that notion. And in fact, if you go back and look at the original corporations, the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company, in their charters, they had social purpose and mission written into those charters. And our companies of today are heirs to that role. We may disagree with those missions, um, but the mission of Crown and Christianity and commerce were all written into their charter, commerce being the third of their priorities, um, the other two being more supreme. Uh, and what we've seen over time is an evolution of the way companies think about their roles in societies. And I would argue that we are in the midst of a great rethinking of the role of companies in society. And if I pick up the history from, say, around the 1950s, where John sort of picked up the, the role of USAID, uh, Companies at that time were largely engaged in what I would call random acts of kindness. They didn't really have um, a defined strategy or a purpose. They were perhaps supporting the local Philharmonic, or maybe they were supporting the local United Way, uh, or they were doing work within their own individual backyards, but not necessarily really aligned with um, a particular business strategy. You roll that clock forward into the 60s and 70s, and this guy named Milton Friedman comes along, and Friedman famously tells business, the business of business is business. And if you have extra money left over, you shouldn't use that for all of these random acts of kindness. You should give that to your shareholders and let them do that. Uh, and Jack Welch, who at the time um, you know, comes in, 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 the, in, the, in around that same time, starts at GE, he picks up on this idea and instills what is now today the school of shareholder primacy. That really what we should, if we're business owners, we should care most about shareholders and value for them. Everything else is secondary. That idea takes such hold of the minds, particularly of American corporations, also as well in Europe, but particularly here in the United States, that we begin to think of it like it's a law, and it's not a law. Shareholder primacy is not a law. It is not written into corporate uh, charters. There's nothing that requires them to do that, but it, is such, it has such a hold on our mindset that um, that's what almost all companies in the United States, particularly large publicly traded companies, start to take on that shareholder primacy mindset. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, what you start to see is this guy, Michael Porter, comes along. And Michael Porter, who is a professor at, at, at uh, Harvard, Harvard, he proposes an alternative theory called shared value. And the idea behind shared value is, OK, I get it, what you're saying, Milton, but I think that there are probably things, long-term investments that companies could make that would have social purpose, that would serve the long-term strategic interests of the company. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you can find those examples where you can align corporate investment with social purpose, uh, then that makes sense, and you should go forth and do that. Jeffrey Immelt comes in to GE in the early 2000s and picks up that mantle and runs with it. And that countervailing theory, where I think shareholder primacy is still probably the dominant school of thought, this alternative theory of shared value has begun to take hold in many corporations. Um, particularly, uh, I think it's really wildly popular in, in Europe. Um, uh, Unilever and Paul Pullman are really sort of the poster children in Europe for that kind of thinking. And GE, slightly less successful. Jeffrey Immelt's, you know, now retired, slightly less uh, uh, of a 
beacon of management success that Jack Welch was, but still people do look to him and his example. That, I think, tracks very interestingly along with the history that you told, John, about uh, the history of, of um, USAID. As you see, um, you know, the Development Credit Authority uh, getting authorized in the 60s. We see, we see um, DIV and the GDA getting authorized, you know, later uh, as providing targeted instruments for targeted investments uh, and targeted partnerships, which it sort of helps to support and align where companies are starting to think differently about their social purpose and their role um, in international <laughs> development. And I think now what's sort of the emerging thing on the horizon is what we call collective impact. This idea that um, the really big problems that are left to us in society are not single actor or single sector problems. They require multi-stakeholder, multi-sector approaches. Uh, Mark Kramer, who is a colleague of Michael Porter's at Harvard, uh, Mike, Michael and Mark put this theory forward of collective impact uh, and that we need to, to create platforms that would support that kind of multi-stakeholder engagement and involvement. USAID has um, helped to support that with things like um, the broad agency announcement, which we can spend a lot of time talking about, or um, even the new proposal that George Ingram and his colleagues have put forward on the Development Finance Corporation, uh, which would create um, opportunities for multiple agencies within the de development community to work together and to fund particular programs. Uh, the one thing, though, that I want to leave you with uh, is that corporations are not monolithic. They are, they're, they are all, they, they, like humans, they exist on a spectrum. And the vast majority of corporations don't think about social purpose and they don't think about international development. Um, most companies, well, in fact, I would say almost all companies get to be what they are because they specialize in something. And that specialization is rewarded by the market for their specialization. Thinking about big picture issues like international development and social purpose, very few companies have the time or the energy to devote to it. And even those that do, only a few people within the company mm -hmm. are rewarded for doing that. Most are actually almost actively punished for doing that. You're, mm -hmm. go, go back to work, do what you're, we're paying you to do, do those things. Please don't bother us with these bigger issues. And even mm -hmm. in business school, we used to teach them as externalities. You know, in fact, please actively ignore them. They're <laughs> distractions. Please focus on producing more widgets at a certain rate. More companies are starting to think this way, but I still want you to to realize that it's really only a minority of companies. It's not the vast majority of companies. And it's only really a few of the bigger, more successful multinationals um, that are doing that. OK, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an intriguing uh, picture of uh, how uh, views have affected uh, performance <clears throat> and uh, the evolution of private sector attitudes. This is we've seen an evolution in public sector attitudes that John referred to. To. Well, Sean, it's up to you now to bring us up to date. Uh, the uh, work within USAID now has picked up some very big challenges with, with Speed the Future, Power Africa, other big worldwide uh, initiatives that, uh, bring the, that depend very much on constructive relationships, including uh, with the private sector. Uh, the Development Lab is a, is a new institution that uh, is perhaps not known to, to uh, uh, a lot of the alumni. Uh, the uh, governance principles for managing these complex multi-party relationships uh, are easy to recite, but hard to make them work. <laughs> and can you tell us, how is it all working now in today's USAID as you try to face these big challenges in a way that is collaborating with uh, many partners, including especially in the private sector. Sure, well, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, there's nothing that keeps you more on your toes than being in a, a room full of your former supervisors and bosses. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it is absolutely an honor to be here with all of you. And uh, I, I'm not even going to try to teach any of you anything uh, today. What, what I Basically, I would like to provide a little bit of that update about where a lot of the work that you were involved with, uh, creating uh, creating uh, doctrines and and principles around partnership, 
uh, setting up some of the mechanisms by which we could partner effectively. Uh, how we've taken some of those and produced really big, um, uh, we're trying to produce really big results that are hoping to tackle some of the biggest problems we have uh, in, in the world. Uh, I'm going to limit myself to the, the kinds of things that I've had personal involvement with, um, which in the partnership space actually is, is uh, quite a few. So I'm, I'm, I've been very fortunate in my career so far. Um, Currently, I'm, I'm in the Bureau for, Feed, the food, or Bureau for Food Security, which implements the, uh, the billion-dollar annual uh, Feed the Future program uh, across 11 agencies. It's a global portfolio. Uh, what we recognized very early on in the creation of that bureau about eight or nine years ago is that there was absolutely no way that whether it was a billion dollars or $50 billion, that we were going to resolve the, uh, the food security crisis that continues to actually grow every single year, whether it's due to conflict or climate change or anything else. And so we, we immediately started looking at what are, the, what are the ways that we can engage other actors in this space, other actors who, who have a stake, who have resources, who have expertise, who have a presence in a lot of these countries. And since, since the beginning of the Bureau for Food Security and the beginning of the Feed the Future, this interagency uh, initiative, uh, we've been partnering with uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, all the way down to the mom and pop shops that have developed some kind of refrigeration system in their barn in upstate New York. And we've been trying to, we've been identifying ways that we can support the work that they do so that it complements all of our, whether it's a mission level strategy or a Washington level global strategy, uh, identifying ways that a, a true partnership between us and a country uh, uh, and a company or a group of companies actually can make some impact uh, in the space in, in which we're working. So now we, we've, uh, we have statistics that range somewhere, uh, notwithstanding the statistic that Jim already mentioned, which is, I'm absolutely sure is correct because it, it was on our website. Uh, <laughs> on the, in the, just in the Bureau for Food Security, there, we've, we've recorded now over 2,500 public-private partnerships. Uh, that's with, again, from the Fortune 500s all the way down to the mom and pop shops uh, operating out of their barn. Uh, and those are continuing. And in fact, what, what the Bureau for Food Security is doing now is actually from a, from a central bureau standpoint, kind of taking a step back with what we are funding directly. And instead, we are going to go out and we're going to help all 80 plus missions out there replicate the, the public-private partnership model within their own missions. We hope it starts, it will start in the agriculture and food security space and nutrition space, but we're hoping it actually kind of starts to infect other missions, uh, other, op other offices within those missions uh, to the extent that they're not already uh, doing some of that more aggressive public-private partnership work. Power Africa is another model. Uh, it's also an interagency initiative. Uh, it's got 12 U.S. government agencies that mobilize their tools and resources to attack a common problem. It's a global portfolio. But unlike Feed the Future is that Power Africa is absolutely 100% based on the power of the private sector. If you don't partner or work with the private sector, whether there's any money changing hands or not, there's no way you can get a power deal done in a particular country. There's no way that an infra a set of important infrastructure uh, investments are going to be made. There's no way that those private banks are going to come in and even talk to that civil society organization um, uh, from the most rural part of Tanzania, for instance. And so that model from day one starts us talking with the private sector. Uh, and, and it is a very powerful model to the point now where that, that program has recorded in just, I think they're at about a four and a half year mark, uh, $54 billion in private sector commitments to invest in power sector projects in Africa. That's astonishing. And there are only, only about, a, only, I say, 140 companies that have officially signed up for Power Africa. So 140 partners with, uh, with $54 billion. Those are massive investments that I hope will make a big dent in uh, changing the, the future of the electricity sector in, in Africa. Uh, the lab, uh, Jim mentioned the lab, and the lab um, is, is an impressive tool. What I, I do view the lab as a tool. What they are trying to do is basically identify uh, the real advancements that they can make 
uh, in whatever sector it might be, and it truly is whatever sector, using technology, using great ideas, uh, in collaboration with academic institutions, private sector, whatever it might be, and then trying to attack real problems. First with a little bit of seed money, and then if that idea takes hold, they put a little bit of more money in, uh, and, and it's in true partnership over a number of years trying to get big ideas, big technologies rolled out and commercialized so that the rest of the world can, can take advantage of them. And they used a lot of the traditional, I would call them traditional, tools that we've been using over the past 20 years, for, for instance, um, starting with the GDA and the DIV, some of the, the mechanisms that, that Jim mentioned. Uh, they're, they're using those quote unquote traditional mechanisms to do their work. And then we think about, now we're in a phase, so just think we're two decades into trying to perfect these different models, these different approaches. I believe now USAID is entering into a new phase of experimentation. Uh, in Washington, we are rethinking the way, what, how we define partnerships, what, uh, what uh, a partnership means. Is it, is it equal? Is it us funding somebody? Is it a mix of the two? Who's in charge? Who's not? Is there even money changing hands? Uh, and then what are the tools that we need to create that we've not yet considered in order to uh, make those things, uh, and in order to make our next couple decades of partnership development even, even stronger than our last couple decades. Um, I, a great a, example, uh, it's a great example only because I was mission director there, uh, in Mexico, uh, so, uh, we, we receive about $45 million in appropriated funds every year. Using that $45 million, my, my last year and a half, we worked with the team to kind of change the DNA of our mission. Uh, and what we did is we basically took that $45 million and we said, we're going to use our entire appro appropriation to basically catalyze and facilitate private sector investment in a place like Mexico, which a lot of Fortune 500 companies and others have their offices. So we we're a special circumstance there. But after about a year of, of doing that and having everybody in the mission do that and having Washington kind of watching over us and, and monitoring and but not not stepping in the middle of uh, we had gotten to we created a deal book if you will of one billion dollars in public private partnerships using that 45 million dollars on an annual basis that that's an example of experimentation that now we're taking some of those lessons learned from Mexico or from India or Indonesia uh, where a lot of missions are experimenting in this space and we're taking those back to Washington to truly try to impact the way that we all do business on a daily basis. Jim mentioned the, the governance principles uh, uh, as well as, and I would, I would add, the monitoring and evaluation aspect yeah. of, of working with, uh, with the private sector. It all comes down to how you view your partner. It, we, we often get lost in the idea of implementing partner is, yes, while an implementing partner is a partner, it's a different type of partner than if you have a company or a bank or an NGO or a foundation literally putting their own money in, into play and we're, not put, we're matching it, but we're not actually giving them any of the money to implement our program. It, I would call that more of a strategic partnership, strategic alliance. You cannot, I mean, you can ask for data and reporting, but you know the likelihood, unless you've really come to a gentleman's agreement about what that looks like over the long run, you're not. They're not going to send you reports. They've got they've got their day jobs. Um, they they're not focused on re giving us data and reporting back for for USAID's purposes. So the governance principles really are about how you structure a relationship. I believe it's it, it, a lot of it does fall on the personalities involved in a relationship, and I'll talk a little bit later. Uh, I'll have an opportunity, hopefully later, to talk a little about re relationship management. Um, we talk. It's about the relationships, about how you structure them. It's about getting those handshakes early on about what are the expectations uh, between in, in a true partnership where it's truly equal uh, uh, across all of the actors that are at the table. Okay, that uh, is very interesting to hear about all that is going on. Um, I was particularly struck by the effort being made to support the ability of missions to engage uh, and to use these tools so that it is not a centralized Washington effort. Uh, the administrator has been uh, quite clear about 
a, a, a view, an attitude of working to help countries be no longer dependent on aid. And it seems to me that the role of USAID <laughs> in supporting that vision uh, has to be done in the field to a great extent, <laughs> engaging local actors uh, who will take ownership of their own development and using these tools in ways that are adapted to each local context. And it seems to me that, that that's the, the path you're going down now, right. rather than having big programs run out of Washington being pushed out there without the sense of local ownership and adapting to, to local local context. So I'm, well, I'm we'll, very, we'll very happy to hear two, that. Probably, but. So, <laughs> so now that, that, that brings up, where is this all going? And uh, I would like to ask again, each of you in turn, and, and we'll start, start with John on this, uh, to ask how can uh, these partnerships involving the private sector uh, be carried forward in ways that are consistent with that vision that the administrator has expressed in looking at local policy and security environments and U.S. policies and resource constraints. Uh, how should this be going? And what recommendations do you have for the future of USAID program with regard to public-private partnerships uh, with the private sector? John? All right, let me just tick off a few things, but um, to uh, just uh, identify myself with what Jim said, the importance of the private sector programs have to be at the country level. And that was the defining characteristic in the 1960s, the successes in the 60s, and the successes in particularly the 80s. Uh, that they were driven by missions and they were adopted to mission uh, conditions. It's why I believe partnerships uh, with the private sector are deeply rooted in, in, in USAID history. They merit more study, uh, particularly along these, uh, this type of, of issue. Uh, private sec at the same time, I think it's very important to recognize that private sector partnerships have always been controversial and will continue to be so. Uh, at the, by the end of the 60s, they were not recognized as great, a great success story. In the, uh, in the late 80s and 90s, we got into trouble with the export processing zone. So I think you always have to be careful uh, with this. And that's why, again, I think the history of uh, USAID's involvement is e extremely important. I think partnerships uh, work best uh, when the host countries have created an enabling environment for them and a positive uh, growth uh, investment climate. Uh, and they are integral parts of the USAID mission's country strategy. And I think that's one of the things that jumps out at me at the whole 60 year, almost 60 year history of USAID. Um, and uh, I think at the same time, and I think uh, uh, Richard uh, talked about this. You say it in the private sector do not uh, see development process in the same way. And you have to recognize that. And along those lines, that's why I think it's so important uh, to collect and uh, record you say's history, not just of the past 10 or 15 years, but this entire history. I think it's a tremendous success story. I think it's a tremendous uh, example of learning by doing uh, and of USAID leadership. And finally, I think uh, USAID officers need to be uh, better trained uh, in not only these lessons, but how to dialogue with the private sector. Yeah. Yeah. And I look forward to more discussion. On this. Okay, thanks very much. Richard, uh, where do you think uh, this should all be going? Yeah, I, I wanna pick up on a couple of things John and Sean both said. Um, first of all, I think we throw around some terms quite a lot, and they're so overused and so ambiguous that they almost lose meaning. Partner being perhaps one of the most overused terms in this city, um, and private <laughs> sector being another one. Uh, and I think we really need to get very kind of specific about what we mean about those things. Uh, a, a true partnership, in my uh, definition, is one which in, in which there is shared risk and shared reward where uh, both or all parties are bringing something to the table in expectation of getting something um, out of that. 
And I would distinguish not just private sector, but I would distinguish dependent versus independent entities. And in most of my experience, having been on the outside trying to work with USAID and with multilaterals and other bilateral donors, um, they're mostly used to working with dependent entities, um, folks that they can push around and tell what to do. Uh, um, which means that when you are faced then with working with a multinational, a large multinational, whose CEO, by the way, thinks of himself or herself, fairly or unfairly, as a peer to the President of the United States, uh, not, as a, not as a subordinate, but as a peer to that person, um, they can walk away. And they might walk away. And they don't necessarily see, like, oh, like, and, and I think Sean was really right, all these reporting requirements. I, I was just talking with the CEO a few weeks ago who was trying to do a deal with IFC uh, that, in his opinion, should have taken two months. It took two years. And the main sticking point was reporting requirements, uh, which they perceived as punitive, uh, which the World Bank and, and IFC saw as anti-corruption. So no real dialogue over that, just do what we tell you to do, was kind of the response that uh, the company kept getting. Fortunately, that company was willing to stick it out and see it through. So we really need to get really specific about that. And, there, and, and in contrast, though, I'd also say that like, there are dependent entities in the private sector. The Development Credit Authority was established to do loan guarantees to small companies. Those are going to be, by nature, dependent entities. They're, that's a loan lender type relationship, not a true partnership. Mm -hmm. So we've got to kind of distinguish between those things. Um, in terms of recommendations, you know, picking up on what John said, I, I would offer four. Um, one, I think what we need is a focus um, on a set of development challenges, just a, a development framework. I would propose the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Doesn't have to be those, but some sort of framework that we say, this is what we're working towards. And then I would recommend looking within those for what I would call solvable problems. There are problems within the SDGs that have been solved somewhere. Those solutions are just trapped. Cervical cancer, as an example, um, uh, post-harvest loss, uh, youth the, the youth skills gap. These are things that have been solved in some place. They're just trapped for one reason or the other. And I think that USAID and bilateral and multilateral donors could be a bridge to help provide the extra finance, the extra convening power, the extra oomph to get those solutions over the edge. And those, those are things also, by the way, that I think the private sector would see a great deal of interest in trying to solve, because they're also business challenges to them, and they would see market opportunities in trying to solve them. So pick a development framework, focus on solvable problems, then focus on how you can provide, be a bridge to markets or to overcoming so, um, structural failures. And then my fourth one is that we need to think about how we can really actively co-create with the private sector. And that goes back to my point about partnership. Right now, we, we've been involved, our, our organization's been involved in a lot of like the BAA type, um, the broad agency announcements and other ways of trying to bring in outside voices and try co-creation. Unleashed a lot of creativity in those processes, but at the end, all of that creativity has to go back through the needle's eye of the procurement process. And all of that great creativity that was unleashed gets stomped down in the effort to make it back into a grant or a contract or a cooperative agreement. So somehow trying to deal with that in a way that is more equitable, but also preserving of all of the things and the, the, the regulations and the laws that we have to abide by, uh, but, but preserving the, the, um, the creativity in the process. And I think a lot of it comes down to something I think both of you said, which is that <clears throat> In my experience, a lot of, there's a lot of innovation going on within USAID, a lot of really, really innovative people. Um, and yet, it is very um, sporadic. It, going from one mission to the other, you don't experience the same level of skill or knowledge or um, uh, familiarity with working with the private sector or working in really uncomfortable, oftentimes creative, um, sometimes uh, risky situations. And a lot of it comes down to the, uh, to the AO. And I think the acquisition, we really need to spend, we have starved the acquisition workforce, in my opinion, of our um, opportunity, of, of, of the capacity and knowledge and skills that they need. And we need to reinvest uh, in, that, in that area. Great, so. thank you. Well, Sean, now you've heard some ideas. Uh, you have to implement a lot of <laughs> how this is all going forward. Uh, where do you see, you say, going? 
in trying to make the most of this tool, you might say, of public-private partnership and the opportunity that it presents for advancing this vision of locally owned development uh, that uh, is enhanced by uh, USAID's interaction and relationships with partners. Sure. So I think one of the thing that one of the things that has plagued the agency, and I'm, I'm speaking very broadly, very generally, um, is that we we haven't had a private sector focus. We've had some tools, we've had some officers who really get it. They know how to work with. The, maybe they came from the private sector. They where they've learned how to speak with the private sector. Uh, they they know the partnership lingo. But I would say the vast majority just haven't gotten there yet. No fault of their own, but but it's it's just a, it's a, it's the evolution of learning. Uh, I, I think we're walking into it. We're in a different world now than we were uh, when the systems and some of the tools were created 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, that's nine, more than 90 percent of the money flowing to developing countries now is not coming from uh, ODA and from donors. Uh, we have to embrace that, not just. One of the things I'll mention is, is not just go back and write a scope of work and then on day you know, 365, then think about, oh, how do I squeeze in these, you know, these private sector actors that I really should have talked to on day one? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is going to fundamentally change the DNA, I believe. Also, I would suggest that it's also not just your economic growth programs or your environment programs. It's across the board. When I was in Mexico, my greatest champion for engaging the private sector was a was a, a second or third tour DG officer. She came up with the most uh, she came up with the most impressive public private partnerships that I've seen anywhere in that space. Um, so if anybody needs a name, you're hiring. She's a foreign service officer, but you never know. Um, so there are there. I have five things that I, I do. Uh, I, I I would like to share with you that I think. Uh, are in line with Administrator Green's vision of, of where the agency is going uh, in, in this space of private sector partnerships um, or partnerships more, even more broadly. He has talked about changing the DNA of the agency. Uh, first of all, I would say that the agency uh, does itself great harm by, by referring to itself as a procurement agency. We, when, you know, when you ask a USAID officer in the field, particularly in their, if they're a first, second, or third tour officer, you'll, you'll ask them, what, so what do you do? And they say, well, I'm an AOR, COR, four, dot, dot, dot. That is not a way that an American diplomat, a development professional, should define his or her responsibilities. And I, and I think gradually it's changing, but not quickly enough. I still hear that from officers. You know, I'm managing that five million dollar grant. Well, that that's not a job. I mean, that's part of your job. That's great, but that's not how you should define yourself. That's not how you should define your role in this organization. We fought hard. You all have fought hard to create an international development discipline that is respected by our peers around the world. USAID is still seen as a development leader, regardless of what anybody says. We really are viewed by all donors, by most countries, as the international development leader. So that was number one, just that we, I think we need to cease referring to ourselves and self-identifying ourselves as, uh, as officers somewhere in that procurement chain. Uh, what I do believe we should refer to ourselves as is what I would, what I would coin or term a, a relationship manager. It's, that's also another term that's very overly used. In, in this context, it's not just saying that I manage the relationship with Coca-Cola or Starbucks or Green Mountain Coffee, whatever it might be. It's referring to yourself as someone who, who is a, I, my job is to manage relationships on behalf of the American people. And the way I do that is threefold. One is I do manage some implementing uh, partners. I manage those agreements. That's one part of my three, three major functions. I also am a leader in the intra and interagency among all of my colleagues in my embassy or in my bureau or in Washington. And third is I will maintain and I will build a robust network of outside relationships of people who are like-minded or not like-minded uh, that are stakeholders in the work that I do. That is incredibly powerful if USAID officers in Washington or overseas would just refer to themselves in some way thinking of those three objectives on a daily basis. 
that will fundamentally change the way that an officer engages with the private sector or an NGO, that fundamentally changes the way that person facilitates development <coughs> projects overseas as well. Uh, third, um, I think when currently, I mentioned this before, our, our default for developing uh, development projects, uh, whether it's here or overseas, is still to go back to our office and draft a scope of work. I think that should not be our default position. Our default position should be, let me understand the full ecosystem in which I'm working. Let me understand those five foundations that are, that are bringing in a couple hundred thousand dollars or a couple million dollars into that country or in that sector. Let me understand what, what Coca-Cola's interests are in potable water uh, or uh, a pharmaceutical, God forbid, a pharmaceutical company's interest in, in, in working in a, in a value chain or, or uh, a distribution chain in a particular country. I think we need to, we, our default should not be going back to our office and drafting a scope of work and then fitting in there somewhere that the implementing partner should find partnerships or <laughs> that, you know, but which usually frankly occurs again, on that day 365 of implementation or even in the fourth year of implementation right before they're, they're getting that last CPR. Fourth, um, I think that the act of partnering is insufficient if you're only bringing one partner to the table. I think if you're, if you're, act, if you're actually trying to change the outcome in a sector or in a country uh, or in a, in a regional, a, a larger geographic area, or if you're just trying to introduce a new model of, of a way that business should be operating uh, in a developing country, I think you should be bringing together all of the partners that have a stake in that sector or that country or that region uh, or that business model to the table. And amazingly, I think uh, officers often underestimate their ability to convene 10, 20, 30 partners in those initial meetings to start talking mm. about what, what are all of our interests here? What are, we all, what are all the tools that we bring to the table? And oh, by the way, we're not going to be funding a $100 million program. What we're going to be doing together is we're actually going to identify the tools and resources that we can all work together over the next four or five years. Oh, and I may not, I may not be able to put on my AEF that, that, I'm, that I'm managing a COR, um, that I'm a COR or AOR for this, but rather I'm, re I'm managing a series of relationships that is going to change a sector or change a country or something like that. And lastly, uh, one thing that I, th I think we commonly fall into the trap of is referring to financial institutions and banks as, uh, as organizations that are just providing money to a project. I think we have to change that perception. I think if we treat financial institutions as partners and look at them as not just uh, our, our partnership sort of, or my relationship with them ends the day they disperse the money <laughs> for a project or a DCA or uh, a, a, a partnership overseas. That if I, can, if I commit to managing that relationship, it goes back to that relationship management idea, managing that relationship for years to come, that you're, you're likely going to have a partner for life for our agency and for that, in that country and in that sector. Okay, well, this has been just uh, just tremendous. I, I, I would like to just uh, uh, mention some of the principles for uh, governance that uh, we alluded to in general terms. Um, and uh, just pull a few of them out of the OECD or the SDG list. And they're, they're, they're agreed context appropriate targets. Do you really know what you're trying to accomplish? Clear roles that avoid duplication. Do we have clear lanes for all of these different partners in the, in the relationship? Transparent communication, important <clears throat> so that you trust each other. Focus on results. Keep it pointed in the same direction and not allow it to diverge in different ways. Incentives for cooperation, so people want to cooperate. Monitoring of performance, as, as Sean mentioned, so that you know how far you're doing and systems for resolving differences so that you don't have it fall apart into discord. Now, this gets back to what you said about, this is kind of a development diplomacy role rather than a development as projects idea. Mm -hmm. And it really is an important way to think about it. And I think we can draw a lot on the history uh, and what we can learn from that 
to inform how we go forward with this way of doing business in a more complex development environment. Uh, so thank, thank you to the panelists, and I think now we have some time uh, for getting this into a broader discussion uh, with the audience and uh, ask them the hard questions and I'll, I'll field them and pass them along. <laughs> let's, let's start over here with the first hand that was up, Marcy. Oh, well, wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> I'm Marcy Birnbaum, and uh, what John has to say harks very strongly with me because I've been involved and my husband was involved with private sector. There's a challenge. Listening to you, Sean, I sit myself and I say, wow, I wish you, you're the senior DAA. I wish you were the administrator. I wish you were the president <laughs> of the United States <laughs> because we... What it's all about in large places is creative people like yourself. Liz Warfield, who worked with public, who developed the public private partnership, went down to Mexico. She had an environment and worked with her staff. So, what we had, what hasn't been said is the conundrum that we deal with and we've dealt with over the years is changing administration and changing administrators. When you talk about getting the DNA, that's a long term action. So, I'm probably going to ask a question that can't be answered. But how do you deal with this change uh, and how it affects the agency over the years? Because what you're talking about is music to my ears. <clears throat> how much power do you have to influence that and what will be the future? Do you want to take another question? Want to take a couple of questions? There's one over here at the other end of the, of the row here. Let's take three and then ask, ask panelists to respond as appropriate. Huh? Okay. Uh, my name is Douglas Sheldon. Um, the one thought I had in listening to the discussion is the, the, this, the conundrum we always have on governance and accountability. And it's, it's fine to recognize that we often will need to operate in a different way on a handshake. And I'm familiar mm -hmm. with how difficult it is to seek reports and seek information. But unfortunately, we're going to have to have some changes that lead to a leap of faith on this because as stewards of federal money, sooner or later, someone comes back to see where that money has gone. And we have to have um, a way of looking at that. We have to accept that not all of our partners work out to be just and honorable people. And we have to have, a, we have, to have some ways to deal with that. So the governance part, while it can't be the same as what we've done, is, and it's an underlying thing, and you've touched about that when you talked a little bit about our being dragged down the road of being an acquisition-based agency. So there's going to have to be okay. some different acquisition tools. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Marilyn. Accountability. How do you preserve accountability? Okay, yeah. uh, Marilyn Zach, I want to follow up a little bit on Marcy's uh, questions. One issue for me has always been this relationship with the State Department and the ambassador you have in the field. All right? And if you have an ambassador who is extremely jealous of his connections or her, it's off, not often enough it's a her, but the fact is that to have all these relationships with these leading business people in your country, and I know at times there's been some issues in Mexico earlier on, that um, the A director doesn't have that ability to reach out without the involvement of the ambassador. So you're dealing with the next layer up, and how then you convince <laughs> your ambassador, if by personality or by direction from Washington, he has uh, a very different view. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Let's see, we have three. Shall we, shall we uh, ask panelists on those? So it's, uh, how do you deal with the changes that occur? You put it in terms of changes of administration, but you could say changes in congressional attitudes, changes. Sure. You know, it, it, there's, there's no consistency necessarily in attitudes and policies. Sure. How do you deal with, with that? 
Uh, how do we deal with accountability? You can't avoid it, uh, but how do you make it workable in this new context? And relationships uh, that uh, we haven't talked about so much are internal relationships with the State Department and with an ambassador in the country where you're trying to do some new things and do them differently. Sure. I think most of these are really for Sean, but I can start let, us off at least. Let me. Uh, why don't you start, and we'll hear here okay. from others. So you know, I think we're in a fortunate period of time where uh, the stars have aligned on the the amount of buy-in that there is uh, in the old administration, the, the new administration, uh, both parties and both houses of Congress. Uh, that there is absolute support for engagement with the private sector. Um, and I, I really do believe that. And I think Administrator Green is as one of the biggest champions. I think we're very fortunate to have someone like him uh, who has come in with an idea of how do we, how do we take the, the tools that we, we've been working at perfecting and then put them on steroids and ramp it up even further? How do we think about them differently? How do we bring tools into different constructs that allow us to do our, our work more efficiently, more effectively? Uh, and I actually, to comment on the, the redesign process, I think actually one of the goals of the, the, the joint state USAID uh, ongoing redesign process actually is also to cr find those efficiencies, find those tools that are particularly effective uh, for uh, working um, with partners outside of the public sector, to be honest. And so I think we have the support that we need right now, um, which is me not answering your question in a direct way because I've not been in a situation where we don't have that support. Uh, and so right now I think it's, it's lasted um, uh, for the uh, almost two decades that I've been in the agency, uh, moving into uh, the phase where we are right now, I only see uh, the stars continuing to be aligned. Uh, the relationship with the State Department, great question. Uh, I've had those experiences, and I think one of the great things about uh, the State Department is that they produce cables. And the cables often say, you should try to work with the private sector as much as you can. And so often, it's just a matter of finding those cables and sharing them with your leadership. Uh, what I did in Mexico is I, I, uh, I worked very hard at making sure the country team got on board uh, with the idea of engaging yeah. non-public uh, sector actors partnering with some of the other agencies at the table and using their resources even to partner with the private sector. It became kind of a, a I wouldn't say a tidal wave, but it certainly became a, there was a momentum that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the ambassador of Mexico was not uh, going to be able to uh, necessarily, well, he could have, but uh, he wasn't going to step in the way of. Um, again, I, 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 it, just, it'll, connects with my first point, which is I believe that the, the stars are aligned, whether it's at the State Department, USAID, the Hill, uh, wherever, and across the interagency, I believe that the, the, there is a desire to explore ways that we work with other non-public sector actors out there and, and finding the most efficient, effective ways of doing that. Uh, on the accountability angle, really quickly, um, I think we're, st we're working on, on, on identifying more ways of being accountable for the, 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 the progress that we believe that we're making under public-private partnerships. We're trying to develop an evidence base. We are identifying new ways uh, of, or new tools within the existing FAR uh, that we can utilize within USAID. Uh, the uh, broad agency announcement uh, that Richard uh, mm -hmm. mentioned is actually one of those tools that's been around for a long time, but we just didn't make a lot of use of it within the agency. It's a, a perfect collaboration tool uh, uh, that we didn't use until maybe the past three or four years. Um, and there are other ones too uh, out there that we are exploring or identifying. When I was talking a little bit earlier about the handshake, I was thinking more about when no money changes hands. Uh, what, are, what, what, what are the ways that you can make sure that you're still lockstep with your, your partner? Um, and those, in, in fact, still a lot, in, in, in grand terms, rely a lot on, on those handshakes. But anytime there, still, anytime that there's money changing hands, there's going to be some kind of paper contractual agreement between uh, um, uh, us and that party that's receiving our money. Yeah. Great. I would say take another round. Can I, can I, I just want to comment on a couple of quick oh, things sorry. there. Yeah. Um, 
First of all, with regard to the changes in administration, I was on a panel yesterday with George Ingram, and he had a lot of statistics. He quoted a great study yeah. about how foreign yes. aid is essentially outside of American politics. The support for it has neither changed or gone up or gone down in the general electorate in, in like the last 30 or 40 years. A lot of kind of scary talk in the beginning part of this administration that came to essentially nothing <clears throat> thanks to you know, strong bipartisan support in Congress. Um, so the, the change administration, has, to, to, from my perspective, has not had that great of an impact. Has had an impact on morale. I won't, I won't get rid of, won't dismiss that. <laughs> but um, in terms of the actual political reality of it, not, not, not as much. On the governance and accountability part, I, I would point out a couple of things. I think um, my friend Ricardo Michel used to say that we treat uh, development like a low-risk activity when it's really a high-risk activity. And if we were uh, a venture fund, Venture funds make money um, by failing 90% of the time and hitting it once, right? 90% of the things in the portfolio might fail. 10% has a huge outsized impact and, and, and return, and, and they continue to make money. When you're dealing with a taxpayer or donor dollar, that's a lot different, and you can't necessarily take that sort of uh, level of, of, of ROI. I do think, though, that there is an opportunity. You mentioned new acquisition vehicles. I think that there's some real thinking to be done there. I think we also need to have a different relationship with um, a f what is not a four-letter word, profit, uh, which I think has had a, a there, are, there are, I'm sure no one in this room, but I think some in the development community um, are repulsed by the idea of the profit motive um, and question whether or not we can really work right. with for-profit companies. Um, and if you can change, though, that relationship to profit and you can think about how you might use that as a way of transferring risk from the government to the private sector, there's an opportunity there. Um, the, the exact counting of things and the accountability of things, that gets harder. Um, Kahneman Tversky, who, Daniel Kahneman and um, yeah. uh, Tversky won you know, Nobel Prize yeah. for the, the you know, behavioral economics. And I forget which one used to always say, it's sometimes easier to change the world than it is to show that you've changed the world. Uh, so how we count, account for things, I think, is still, uh, a challenge, but I do think that we should be thinking about changing the way in which we relate to the private sector, particularly when it comes to the profit motive and how we can build new acquisition vehicles and acquisition tools for transferring that risk. And you mentioned you know, clear roles in avoiding duplication. The thing about markets is that markets don't care about duplication. Markets allow lots of duplication, and they let it go, and then if there's too much, it goes away. If there's too little, we encourage more. So worrying about duplication is less of an issue to me, more about like how do you actually get to the impact. So I'll stop there. Okay, John, anything? No, let's go to another round. Okay, let's, let's go another round. Let's take this side of the room and then we'll come back and we'll get the middle. Okay, who's over here? Paula. Thank you very much. Um, back to a comment that John Sombrello mentioned earlier, and that was the business enabling environment in the countries in which we work. We've been talking a little bit on the supply side of things, the money from aid, from the cooperation of the other companies. But what is USAID doing, or what's your observation about what USAID should do, for example, with the economic growth practices and um, working on that element of the receptivity mm -hmm for these types of activities in the countries so that they'll be more successful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Another one back. Right behind you. Way in the corner. I'm sorry, what? Back right there. Is that Bambi? Thank you. Um, this is a very, very nitty gritty question, but I think it go, it's right at the heart of the point that you made, Sean, about taking this out to the missions. And um, uh, if, those of us that come out of the GDA and DLI era of management, um, what we saw was, and I think this is one of the reasons Administrator Four coupled those two things together as her two goals, um, was the tremendous management intensive nature of public-private mm -hmm. partnerships, be they ones that come to fruition or the very high percentage that never do, um, working with the indigenous private sector has been one of the reasons that our regulations on both DCA and GDA got longer and longer and longer. <laughs> um, you know, of the seven GDAs that I inherited in Peru, six of them produced, you know, 200-page audit reports. Um, 
The concern I have right now, and this is the nitty gritty part, is the freeze on staffing. What do you do when you're no longer hiring people to do the work that is required for these partnerships, which are so satisfying and so you know forward looking, but what do you do in the case we're now in? Thanks. Okay, one more. Okay, Marilyn. Wait, wait, here comes a microphone. Okay. USAID is still considered a leader, I would agree. And one of the big things is that USAID has, you know, had these evaluation measures, such as the project measures, such mm -hmm. as FUSE, which plays very much in food security. It seems to me that these are very important. And when you talk about something like any kind of partnership, this should be part of the ecological environment. So I'd like to know how do you um, protect those measures and they do play a role sometimes in creating demand too because people see what the problem is Certainly. and then they realize they have to do something okay thanks there's three uh, I think we should probably be going uh, <laughs> because these are really about the, the, the present situation what do we do now so Sean why don't you, sure. you take the lead and we'll we'll go down the line sure well, uh, to Paula's point, I think that policy reform, uh, the enabling environment for business growth, uh, for um, the free flow of capital, uh, is going to remain paramount for USAID programs, should remain paramount uh, for USAID programs in every country in which we're working. I don't believe we can get to the point of what Administrator Green calls uh, strategic transition, which is, which in some cases may be defined as graduation from a country, but most often it means just moving, changing the relationship over time with a developing country. You can't have that change uh, in a relationship in a country if the private sector is still uh, uh, restricted, forbidden from making a profit, controlled by the state, um, not allowed to import the most innovative ideas and, and technologies. Um, so I do believe that uh, the economic policy reform work that we've become uh, really good at doing and continue to do in most places should remain paramount uh, for, for, for USAID programs overseas. Um, the, uh, it, it is, uh, Bambi, the, the, it is management intensive, absolutely. I think for, I, I don't have statistics on this, but I'm just going to put out there that it's probably for every one public or private sector relationship that turns into something, you're probably actually talking to seven to 10 companies or organizations. That is a lot of time that may or may not result in anything. That is, an, that is a, a tremendous burden on the existing staff uh, of uh, our missions, but also our, our headquarters staff back here in Washington to, to cultivate and manage those relationships. I think the one weakness of that relationship management approach that I mentioned earlier on is, is that it, 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 fun, it requires that how we spend our time on a daily basis uh, changes, that the formula uh, and how we, we focus our energies when we wake up in the morning and we come into the office or not in the office, being mm -hmm. out there, uh, changes. Uh, and, and I'm not, I, we haven't figured that out yet. That, that's part of that experimentation phase. During a hiring freeze, I do believe that what is suffering more than uh, other things is, are the partnerships, unfortunately. Mm. I think we have contracts and grants and programs that we need to manage. There's a fiduciary responsibility of managing taxpayer funds. Uh, and that is still going to remain the priority, even if you stop referring your, to yourself as an AOR, COR when, you, when, when somebody asks you. Uh, but your, your responsibility is to manage those taxpayer funds well and, and represent your country effectively overseas. I, I think the, what falls off, unfortunately, is you know, as you lose one staff and then another staff, mm. uh, and then by the end of a year, you're down 10% of your staff in a mission or 15% uh, of your staff have departed in a bureau. I, unfortunately, I think the core, or fortunately, the core responsibilities are st still going to be addressed. I think it is these, these, these partnerships that, uh, unfortunately, you're just not gonna be able to spend as much time and invest as much time in. Um, on the man, or sorry, on the on the what I would term an evidence-driven culture that we've built inside USAID, I do believe that they are entering 
the picture with our public-private partnerships. One of the things, in addition to our global presence, uh, our development knowledge that we do have, one of the things that, that most organizations are coming to us for is, is access to the, the systems and the data that our, us and our partners have, have created and that we own and that we hold. And we, they'd like to partner to share, to either share their information and complement ours and, uh, or vice versa. Uh, and I think that's actually going to continue. I think, I, I think the fact that we're an evidence-driven organization now more than ever in our history uh, is actually a selling point for continuing and expanding these public-private partnerships. Um, just really quickly, I'll add, um, <clears throat> My organization is called Collaborate Up, so it might seem ironic for me to say one of the things we always tell our clients is if you can do it without collaboration, you should. Um, collaboration is expensive, it's timely, time consuming, um, and it's complicated. So uh, you're right, it, it's very management intensive, and because of that, we often, we really say you should only collaborate on those things that really require collective action. So. When it comes back to being evidence-based, the question I think we should ask ourselves is, did this thing really require collaboration in the first place? If it did, and I've just spent the last three weeks locked in rooms in the Ronald Reagan building working on M E L plans for collective action, uh, the question that we're trying to build into those M E L plans is, did the act of collaboration actually accelerate or improve the impact in some way? And looking for how to build in those sort yeah. of evidence-based measures mm. to do that. Um, and the, but it, I think it starts with that gating question, did this need collaboration in the first place? And if it did, how can we show that the act of collaboration uh, accelerated the impact? I'd like to just uh, pick up on what Paula said again on the enabling environment. This is just not important, it's fundamental. Uh, and it's why programs need to be mission-based because every country is different. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just look at uh, the World Bank series of doing business in countries, which give you a perfect analytic framework. Uh, if I understand it correctly, they were inspired by using. Uh, the bank was uh, urged to do those types of things. It's how you translate that into action. And again, I would go back to, I think USAID has a unique way of, ha of improving that environment of the enabling environment by working through uh, think tanks, local universities, uh, NGOs, and there are a whole host of examples uh, from the most dramatic of the whole Chilean model to other countries where fundamental uh, policy reforms have been brought about to improve the investment climate because of USAID leadership both through local NGOs, but most importantly, through the concept that Jim Michael keeps coming back to, and that's development diplomacy. There is no substitute to an activist mission, uh, mission director and mission staff who understand how the dialogue with the host country, with the private sector, and make things happen. Okay, last round. Is this Larry? Thanks. Uh, Richard, I really like the uh, breakdown of the historical evolution of the private sector, and I'm wondering if you can drill down a little bit. You talked about being on the m and &L side for USAID, but really in today's world, what is the m and &L that the uh, private sector applies when they're looking at it? Mm -hmm. it? You know, they clearly, I mean, profit, obviously, but, yep. but what, how else do they frame it? Um, you know, they don't want to get into the detailed type of... Uh, monitoring evaluation plans maybe that the uh, public sector has, but what, what are their, their metrics for determining beyond pure profit? Yep. Okay, great. Let's see, one over here, right there. And we'll come back to Barbara and we'll get one more. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Andrea Harris. Um, I wanna follow up on two questions, the one about accountability and the one that you just made which is um, we're talking about managing risk and having shared risk in any partnership. And the risk profile is very different for us as managers of public funds. And that's, that's the primary risk we need to manage is the political perception and the, act, and the actual 
a reality of how efficiently we are able to manage those funds. Our corporate partners have a very different risk portfolio. Generally, it has to do with reputational risk. It has to do with uh, product safety. There are a lot of different things that they do measure. And when you are actually in the middle of managing a large partnership between those two kinds of entities, sometimes you feel like you're in the middle of a du dueling bureaucracy yeah. uh, situation and they're different uh, compliance, totally different compliance frameworks. So um, question yeah. is, how do, what kinds of lessons do you have to share with us about how to okay. uh, cope with Different perspectives of, of risk, okay. Uh, there was one down here and then one in the back. Uh, Steve, uh, Barbara? Hi, I'm Barbara Bennett, and I particularly wanted um, to commend Sean for, uh, I'd worked for, obviously with the Congress for 30 years before I retired, and I think what we dealt with, certainly in this past administration, and, and obviously historically, is the um, skepticism of using the private sector from the Hill partners. I, I mean, all the way, whether they're Republican or Democrat. Uh, Republican because they're afraid we're going to make somebody else more competitive or uh, Democrat just because they don't like the profit motive, <laughs> but whatever it was. But I really, on Power Africa and also on food security, one of the things, Sean, you haven't mentioned is the overwhelming amount of um, investment and support we got from the African private sector in both cases, food security and Power Africa. And that was very new for the Congress to have that kind of money that was coming into a mm. USAID initiative. And a lot of the yeah. work that, a lot of the results would come from you know, these African private sector people they'd <laughs> never heard of. Yeah. And I think that um, it took us some time, but I think people now begin to realize that. And so I'd like for Sean to kind of talk a little bit about that because there were real reasons why yeah. we wanted the African private yeah. sector. Right. And of course, one of the biggest reasons was just, well, number the one reason was that the US a private sector was more risk averse. And I think in Africa, yeah. and I think that was part of it. Part of it okay, but, thanks. Yeah. Last question, Steve Klein over here. Thank you for Sean. You outline, I think, quite energy, energetically a very interesting training program for aid people that says, here's the way we want to make a transition to thinking about the role of our aid officers in dealing with private sectors overseas. Does aid have a training program that, okay. that has gone through with that and implements it for all of our officers if they decide that this is what the agency wants to do. Okay, okay. I think we have to cut it off or we will cut into the coffee break here. Uh, let's see, so we have four questions here. The differences in risk management for the public sector, which is taxpayer money, and the private sector, which is, is, is the image of the corporation, of the corporation survive. Uh, the congressional skepticism of the private sector and the importance of local private sector participation in the partnerships. Uh, and uh, I, I left out Larry Garber about the differences in, mm. in M, E, and L analysis by the private sector as opposed to how we look at uh, this in the, in, the, in the public sector. And finally, uh, training for the new paradigm. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so first of all, I'll stay, start off with a bunch of caveats. And my first caveat will be that, again, like I said at the beginning, not all private sector is the same, not all companies are the same. And I'm going to confine my remarks mostly to publicly traded uh, companies um, because that's where we have the most knowledge and insight into what they're doing. Uh, what goes on within privately held companies, we have less knowledge of. But within publicly traded companies, I think there's a couple of things to think about. There are two financial reports that they really pay very close attention to. Uh, and when people talk about the value of corporate citizenship, the value of participating and working with the public sector and the civil sector, a lot of people focus on the profit and loss statement. So the degree to which it's going to help them grow revenue or to save money. There is a much more interesting and much more compelling financial statement called the balance sheet. And on the balance sheet lives something called goodwill. And in goodwill is brand equity. 
And that is the difference. In fact, most of about, you know, if you look at the, at the <coughs> book value of a company like Apple or of Coca-Cola, the book value, which is if you added up all the stuff that they own, it's less than 20% of the, 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 the total stock value, the publicly traded value of the company. So that goodwill, that brand perception, that's what they're trading on. That's what their CEO is compensated on. Most of the compensation is in stock, not in cash. Um, so they pay very close attention to that. And a lot of the value that they derive is from seeing you know, that move up or down. Um, and they evaluate risk, uh, as you said, in terms of um, the reputation of the company uh, and also the, the potential that that has to add to their brand value. I would also say that with companies, the more regulated they are, the more close their relationship is with the government, the more they understand government. The less they are, the less they do. So Silicon Valley has less of an understanding, less of a pattern recognition for what you guys do. Aviation, other government contractors, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, they have more of a pattern recognition because they're used to dealing with government and they can see it and they evaluate it probably in similar terms to what you do. Uh, what I would suggest is really like thinking about looking at, um, there's, they publish a lot of this information. They have corporate citizenship reports, they have annual reports. They're telegraphing what their interests are. And I think what you're looking for are companies that are um, pursuing uh, growth opportunities in the developing world. And they're going to publicize that, number one, and they're going to evaluate in a different way. And what they're looking for are access to markets, the ability to reach customers that they wouldn't have been able to reach alone, bridging to those markets because there's some barrier, that's some cost barrier or something else that's standing in their way, um, or they're, in, they're worried about freedom to operate you know, in, those, in those environments. Um, and those are the factors that they're looking to evaluate. So I'll stop okay. there. Any comment? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll hit the easy one first. Training okay. program. Oh, it's not easy, but uh, yeah. training program. Uh, so I, th I think there is a, uh, a process underway right now to re-envision the way that officers are trained. There have been the traditional economic growth officers training. There's been partnerships training. There is lab training um, as a bureau that has its own suite of tools. Uh, but I don't think it, it, it still doesn't come together in, in some of the ways that I've been talking about it today. And I think it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, I think as uh, Administrator Green articulates his uh, vision for how some of these things and other things will come together, I think that will ultimately influence uh, the training program, but I'm not sure it's going to happen that quickly, to, just to be honest with you. I think there, there's, there, was two, there were two questions that I think are somewhat related on risk profiles um, uh, between the public sector and the private sector. Uh, they are different, absolutely. And then, and then with the, the Hill's skepticism of working with the private sector and how have the resources of the, the local private sector changed their minds. I think what changed their minds is the the um, the 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 recognition that there were that first of all there are multi-billion-dollar multinational companies outside of our borders. Um, I think also the fact that they came together and they're willing to put something on the table, uh, and in some cases there was they weren't receiving. In most cases, they weren't receiving anything from us. Rather, it was truly a strategic partnership of. We've identified, we and others have identified a common problem. We're all going to attack it in a different way. Um, I think that that reflection of others willing to take on that risk is changing minds about, and I, I think it really is uh, uh, changing the, the way that, that our appropriators, our, our authorizers, and our stakeholders view us in this space and, and vice versa. Um, let me, I have two really quick examples of how this is all coming together, and it does reflect that risk as well. So um, Administrator Green, just two and a half weeks ago, he announced um, s something called the Fall Army Worm Alliance. Uh, Fall Army Worm is, a, is a, a little worm that we have here in the U.S. It's in South America as well, but it's just recently uh, arrived in Africa. It has the, the ability to devastate uh, Africa's agricultural sector, uh, wiping out crops everywhere, anywhere from, you know, 40 to 75 percent, if you can imagine a hit like that. Africa, and, there, and it's, it's moving at light, lightning speed. Africa currently doesn't have the ability to deal with it. And so, Administrator Green, he went to the World Food Prize in Iowa a couple weeks ago, and he 
asked all the multinationals, the donors, the rich folks who are out there, hey, let's work together on this common problem. We're not necessarily going to fund you, but what we will do is we will convene experts and we will convene all of you so that we can identify our areas of expertise and then cooperate over the next the coming years to get your new seed varieties, your new fertilizers, your new pesticides in there, uh, better pesticide or uh, pest management practices at the at the farmer level, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We are now a, a convener. We're using our role, uh, our, our power as a convener to have a r massive public-private partnership that is not going to cost us very much money, but that could change the future of Africa, frankly. And second, we, we, another, uh, I was in Amsterdam a couple weeks ago, and this touches to the risk idea. I, was, I literally was sitting around the table with senior vice presidents and CEOs of some of the largest corporations in the agriculture sector, and we were talking about a public-private partnership that all of us would be a part of, of between one and three billion dollars uh, to uh, change invest, the way that companies invest in agriculture, basically. And we spent two days it was in Amsterdam, so it wasn't that bad, but we spent two days, uh, uh, two days just talking about the risks of all, the risks and tools of all of our organizations and how we can come to agreement about what we share, what we don't share, how much risk I'm actually willing to assume, uh, and, and, and so forth. So th these are examples of how things are, we're, we're looking very ambitiously at the way that we engage the private sector and the way that uh, we, we work um, uh, towards this idea of, of equal partnerships. Okay. Well, this has been very informative for me and very stimulating. Uh, it seems that we are really in a new era of development cooperation. It's not uh, grants from rich countries governments to poor countries' governments. It is a lot of actors, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different financing sources. And if USAID is going to be an effective participant in this new era, it is going to be because it figures out how to manage partnerships in a way that serve shared interests. And we are at a time in, in the world's history right now where there's a lot of separatism and disagreement and people pulling apart rather than pulling together and collaboration is kind of more difficult at this time. And you're going to have to have the resources in order to implement these important big ideas. So there's great opportunity and as always some, some big challenges, but uh, it's been very interesting to learn about them. And uh, you have, I think in the USAID alumni, uh, a large, pool of support for what you're trying to accomplish. So thanks to all of the panelists for your contributions. And I think we're going to stop here and have a coffee break. Thank you. It's been a very rich discussion. Um, now we go to coffee break and uh, discussions and catching up with others. There is, uh, I don't want to note that uh, Sean Jones brought a, a stack of pamphlets on Feed the Future Snapshot Progress Through 2017. Their stack will be out on the table where the other handouts are, if you want to pick it up. And please um, enjoy your coffee, but please do be back in your seat by 11, before 11.30, okay? Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to move on to the next panel, please. Thank you all. We are excited to have uh, our second panel, which is um, parallel in quality, uh, but a slightly different focus. This is on the focus on USAID and university partnerships. Um, as someone just told me, this, this is the discussion of, and in fact, maybe the uh, enabling environment for the other the other um, kinds of private sector partnerships, uh, and we are very fortunate to have with us today Montague Dement, also known as Tag Dement. <laughs> um, Tag is the vice president of international programs at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities AP (APLU), and an emeritus professor at the University of California, Davis. Um, he's also the architect of APLU's Africa-US Higher Education Initiative. 
an, and an advisor on the Food Security Initiative, and a former director of USAID's Livestock, Livestock, Livestock Crisp, and a longtime partner with USAID. So, Tag, thank you for moderating the session. Thank Over you. to you. Are we on? Are we on? Yes. Can they activate? Oh, ah, I've been activated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, um, I uh, have to say I'm, I'm a little, uh, what should I say, feeling a bit fragile with all these people who have worked in this agency for so long. Um, I actually first worked with USAID in the 1960s as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia. And, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, we got USAID support to help establish the Simeon Mountain National Park. And believe it or not, my then what you might call a AOTR, got on a mule and rode for a day to come and visit us and inspect the buildings we had built and spent a couple of days drinking what is called casa birra, uh, cold beer. And, and uh, it would be, I would be hard pressed to see that happen again uh, for a number of reasons, but it was a wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here in Washington um, as I retired as a professor. I'm in what I call rehirement. Um, uh, 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 Peter McPherson, who I think you all know, um, convinced me to come and work at APLU uh, on things. Peter and I had worked on a number of uh, at, uh, things together in the past. And uh, uh, as many of you know, Peter's a great person to work for. And I think his role as administrator of USAID was one of the high points um, of the agency. Uh, today's panel, we have per three perspectives on partnerships. We're going to look at um, human and institutional capacity development issues, um, and then technical and research uh, capacity in the health sector, and then partnerships to help better understand the development process. Um, we have On our panel, we have Dr. Takora Jones, uh, who's the acting director of the Center for Development Research and chief of the HESN, the Higher Education Solutions Network at USAID. Welcome, Takora. Uh, we also have Dennis uh, Carroll. Dr. Dr. Carroll is the director of the Global Health Security and Development Unit um, at USAID. And uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Kabisa Ijeta, who's the professor, a professor at Purdue and uh, a World Food Prize laureate, and who is personally in some ways connected to some of the points that I will raise or we will raise uh, in this discussion. I would say that, that frankly, U.S. universities are, are one of the great na national resources that we have for both building human capital creating uh, uh, technologies and information. And frankly, since World War II, been a force in driving our, our economic growth and driving the equality within our society. Um, that's being somewhat challenged today, but that's, a, that's an issue for another discussion. Um, the, when I talk about universities, I, we represent APLU, which used to be nostalgic. Um, it, we had a, Peter changed the name for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, uh, APLU represents all the big public research and uh, universities in the United States, which include the land grants. But one of the great challenge, one of the great strengths of our university system is its diversity. And there's private universities, there are community <laughs> colleges, there are state universities, there are uh, our large university research sy systems. And that great diversity gives USAID not only a strength to engage, but a diversity to engage that allows to, you to do a number of things. Um, so before I, we, we get the panel going, I, just, I was asked to give a little history, and that's where I get a little timid here because you all know that you've lived the history. Um, I have been an outside stakeholder in that history, but have not been internal. Um, clearly, we in the university community all reflect back to Truman's um, inaugural speech in which he had four points, and the point four of that speech was all about how to address poverty, 
and hunger in the world, lift developing countries up. And interestingly, he engaged uh, John Hanna, who was then president of Michigan State um, and president of Nostalgic at the time. And Hanna, who later became administrator, as you know, um, embraced this and said, okay, we're ready to do something about this. And particularly, it was focused at that point on agriculture. And um, one of the first programs that was started was started in Ethiopia, and I happen to know a bit about because I was uh, in Ethiopia and have followed Ethiopia and, in fact, have worked in Ethiopia now for over 50 years. Um, what happened? Well, the Oklahoma State University was engaged to create, um, to basically to build a college of agriculture. And uh, they did two things. They worked to build a college, but they also worked to build a feeder institution, which was the Jima Agriculture and Technical School. Technical School. And one of our panelists, I won't identify, actually went to that secondary school <laughs> <coughs> and went to Alamayu and became a professor at Purdue and worked on striga resistance in sorghum, which probably saved millions of lives in Africa, and got the World Food Prize. He shall remain <laughs> nameless. <laughs> um, but this, this program wasn't just one partnership. Uh, it was 60 plus partnerships every, almost every year. It was a rather remarkable engagement. It built the land grant uh, system of India, for example, and had a huge impact there. And uh, Dean Rusk in the late 80s says it, said it was one of the greatest things that USAID had accomplished at the time. Um, similar uh, efforts were in Brazil. Um, and DRAPA, uh, improved. the Brazilian agricultural economy has grown in large part by the human capital produced um, by their institutions through those partnerships. And, and this was a very active time. What happened then, though, was a decline in support for higher education, which frankly has continued until this day. Um, in the 1970s, with the advent of Title 12 and the CRISP programs, um, the, uh, there was a, a change of focus to put more emphasis on research, less on human capacity development, and well, some on human capacity development, and less also on institution building. The CRISPs were not uh, in a position of, uh, fiscally to have the resources to do such a thing. And agriculture, frankly, declined. I think the budget declined from somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars a year down to somewhere near 200 million over that time period. Then the food crisis of 2007, suddenly the A word became agriculture again, and uh, Feed the Future emerged. Uh, the CRISPs became innovation labs. They expanded from 10 to 24 at presently, and there's a very active area. I would also say, in, in going back a bit, that, that the 60 partnerships that I identified were not just in agriculture, they were in engineering, they were in health. They were broad-based attempts to increase higher education broadly. So one of the things that I think is important to think about as we, we, we start this discussion is the human capital aspect. And much of what, having been in Washington where you can go to a talk every day, if not in the morning and in the afternoon, that's of interest in development, I commonly hear, you know, the bad policies, the poor governance, the, the issues of, of a lack of technical expertise, the problems of partnerships and financial responsibilities. These are really problems of human capital. And human capital is so fundamental to development, yet I, I would love to see a, a greater focus on human capital development. Because frankly, what sustains everything that AID does in the long run depends upon when the project leaves, the people who are left behind. And so the absence or the real 
a loss of interest in higher education. It trains the people who become the entrepreneurs, the policymakers, who make partnerships work in the country, who build the local institutions. Uh, this is something that is somewhat absent um, from the uh, USAID portfolio. So we are, um, we are now going to uh, look at partnerships from uh, the perspective of USAID and universities. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the human capacity and institutional component uh, using universities as research uh, uh, um, uh, collaborators to uh, work in the health area and to use universities' uh, expertise in improving the, the science of development um, through uh, those partnerships. So I will start with uh, Dr. Ejeta and uh, ask you to, to give us a little bit of a, a perspective from your position, both professionally and personally, on human and institutional capacity development. Uh, thank you, Tag. Uh, as Tag indicated earlier, uh, my primary qualification to be here is that I was once a recipient of this valuable education as part of the USAID program. And at different places, I have spoken every chance I get about what that had meant to me personally, what it meant to my country, what it had meant to uh, other nations and people when the opportunity was given a chance. Um, um, but uh, I did that with a lot of energy, if not with sufficient eloquence. But it's truly humbling and um, to be here in front of you and to be able to retell this story from my perspective, a story that you, you all know very well. Um, I consider myself actually a product of the Point Four program, uh, <laughs> splitting hair here, but mainly because both institutions, uh, the high school I went to and the college I went to, were, were both built by Oklahoma State University as part of the original Point Four program uh, in 1954. And, but as luck would have it, all of my education has also been supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development. All of my education took place, actually, during the USAID era. I went to the high school in 1964, went to college in 68, came to graduate school at Purdue uh, by sheer coincidence, recruited by a professor who had a bilateral program with USAID. <laughs> and recruited me and gave me assistantship on the USAID project. So all of my education that really had given me the foundation to become the kind of professional that I have had the opportunity to be was really foundationally was by the US Agency for International Development. And so as I indicated earlier, every chance I get, I have tried to speak very uh, strongly about what that had meant to me. Uh, but this is really the first chance that I have a chance um, to, to, to speak in front of individuals uh, that have served the U.S. government uh, as employees of USAID and made a difference in the lives of so many people uh, such as mine. And so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to be here. And, and every time I speak, even though my professional opportunities came as a result of the graduate program I had at Purdue University or the college degree that I received at Purdue. But really the most transformative part of the opportunity that gave me um, a once in a lifetime was the high school education I received. Uh, I walked 20 kilometers to school in elementary school. We go uh, on a Sunday and come back on a Friday there was no school where I grew up in. And so the next high school will have been about 125 kilometers from where I lived. And there's no way I could walk that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd heard about this school in the western part of the country. 
There are about four boarding schools at a time in Ethiopia, one in commerce, one in technical school, and then two in agriculture. The one was supported by the Ethiopian government, the other one by US government. So I was t tipped by someone to choose as number one this school far away from where I live uh, because of the reputation this school is already having in the country at the time. And that was Jim Agriculture Technical School that Oklahoma State University uh, put up. They put it up because uh, they started recruiting people to come and study agriculture. Well, uh, young kids at that stage uh, running away from the farm they didn't want to go study agriculture. And so they, 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 they put together this feeder program, and as it turned out, they raised their own crop, the better students went to college, and then the rest of us, the rest of the, uh, that didn't go to go to college, will go to be extension service agents and serve the Ministry of Agriculture. It was a very brilliant idea. It worked out because it met the timely, it met the needs of the people. The reason, and why, I, just to personalize it to you, and those of you who have worked in developing countries would know this very, very well. The night before I took my bus ride to Jimma and Jimma Agriculture Technical School, I spent in my mother's hut sleeping on a mat on the floor. The next day, a bus ride would take me to Jim Agriculture Technical School. I have my first bed. And not only that, a clean white sheath accompanied that. <laughs> <laughs> and my life has never been the same since then. And so, talk about getting out of poverty, I already did at that time. And, and to this day, my sentiment and the sentiment of people who went to that school with me and, and the gratitude and, and, and the loyalty we feel to the program is, is, is exactly the same. So, as I said, I've spoken to other people, but this is the first chance that I have a chance to speak to you who represented the agency that gave me the opportunity. And as I speak about the agency, I also say that in terms of U.S. foreign policy, <coughs> governments come and go. Parties change. The one thing from my perspective that never changed, never wavered much in terms of foreign, the U.S. foreign policy is, and, 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 and that has remained to be, to be the symbol of hope and a tremendous gesture, in, a, a, a tremendous expression in, in the, in, in as, as the, for the generosity of the American people and remained true across all governments and the decades, in my opinion, is a U.S. Agency for International Devo Development that is symbolized by, neatly by this handshake, not a handout, but a handshake and partnership with developing countries. As a result of that point number four, a bold new program to provide, to, to provide opportunities to share the benefits of our scientific advances in industrial progress with the people and nations of developing countries. That was what was said in 1949, as you know very well, a lot better than I, in the inaugural speech of President Truman. Repeated, sustained across many leaders and connected, as you remember too, in 2008, when Pro President Obama said, we'll work alongside of you to make your, uh, your, your, your uh, um, uh, um, uh, your lands turn green, and, and, and floor, uh, the, what, what was that? The, um, uh, I, 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 just, I just had it. Um, yeah, we will work alongside you to make your farms flourish and let clean waters flow. And, and across until, from Truman to Obama, <coughs> parties have changed, 
but the support level for USAID's original mission. We have tinkered with it a bit here and there, but that has remained truly true. And so a few years ago, I had the honor of being appointed a member of the BIFAD board, who I still serve. And I had a mentor you know, who had, over the years, seen the role of BIFAD diminish a bit. And he asked me if I really wanted to do this. I said I would. I did it for only one symbolic reason, for what it meant to me. I was once a student, a poor, scrawny child in West Central Ethiopia with no place to go for higher education. And the work of the agency of USAID gave me the opportunity to go to school. What a symbolic gesture. Now, 40 years later, I'm chosen among many to advise the US Agency for International Development so that the agency would, again, provide opportunity for some other scrawny child somewhere in, in a foreign land. And I think the reason I say this to you is an expression of gratitude. You may have made a difference for one single person here and there, and you may have gotten received that, that thank you at the time. But I am trying to tell you here, sitting in front of you, on behalf of so many that have been affected by the work that you have done, by the work that this agency continues to do, with all the criticisms that come and go at it and coming at it, has been so tremendous for so many people. And I say thank you. I'll stop. OK, thank you. Whew. <laughs> uh, Dennis, I, d <laughs> I, I pass. <laughs> well, OK. So actually, I was just in British Columbia at a conference talking about the issues of the complexities of the problems that face the world and that they no longer reside within a single discipline. They're transdisciplinary. And I think NIH, NSF, uh, actually even APLU has published something on the importance of transdisciplinary work. Uh, Dennis's work in the One Health program represents bringing that to bear on health security and development. And I think it's really a, a wonderful place for uh, uh, partnerships with, between USAID and universities. So, Dennis? Great, thank you. Um, thanks for setting such a low bar. For <laughs> <laughs> I, I also have to say this is one part uh, challenging and one part a pleasure. The pleasure part is being with a group of people where the color of my hair doesn't stand out. <laughs> this is good. Uh, the intimidating part is that my very first bosses when I joined AID in 1989, Ann Van Dusen and Nancy Pielemeyer, um, <laughs> you know, you could hear the click, click, click of uh, Ann's uh, high heels walking down the hall, and you knew that you wanted to get out of there fast because <laughs> um, she was coming to demand <laughs> something from you. So. Anyway, uh, thanks. Thank you for having carpets in this room. This is good. <laughs> uh, look, for the the work that I've been focusing on for the last uh, fifteen years has to do with the issues around emerging uh, disease threats, and one of the seminal sort of take home uh, realities about emerging threats, certainly um, emerging viral threats, and even uh, issues around antibiotic resistance, is you know. We have historically um, focused on those events with, as they play themselves out in people, the index case and then onwards. What are the health systems' uh, capacities to be able to deal with those events? But as I entered into this arena uh, 15 or so years ago, it was clear that uh, Mother Nature was much more challenging um, than one might imagine, and that the index case in a human was largely sort of almost the endpoint of a very complex evolutionary process that began further upstream. And so whether we're talking about antibiotic resistance or we're talking about emerging viral diseases, 
uh, to really understand the risks and to really have maximum capability to preempt those risks, not just respond to them. It's really um, thinking about public health with a much larger chapeau, that you need to understand it from a much broader ecologic profile that animals, environment, and people share a common space, and that those microbes that we're concerned about, on the one hand, we say they know no boundaries, right? Then we think about geography, but they also know no special boundaries. And if we are going to really uh, make an impact on those threats, we need to open up the gauge and pay attention to those events before they come into, before they hit people. And that's the beauty of being at USAID, because AID is fundamentally a development agency that focuses on multi-sectoral challenges. So as, as both Anne um, and Nancy knows, that my, my first iteration here was with CDC. CDC is a great organization, but it is a public health organization. If you really want to tackle the challenges of these multi, inherently multi-sectoral uh, threats, you need a multi-sectoral approach towards it. And AID, by virtue of its development footprint, is the most beautiful multi-sectoral global institution anywhere. Um, you can't find another example that is as potentially impactful as USAID, our ability to work in education, to uh, public health, to agriculture, economic growth, environment. It speaks to those inherent multi-sectoral issues. So as we think about how we respond to emerging diseases, and we think about inherently not just the systems that need to be in place that are multi-sectoral, but the workforce that needs to be in place has to be multi-sectoral. And so as we moved into this space, Another beauty of AID being a development agency is that we can take the long view. We can talk about what's that next generation need to look like. And as a consequence, we can invest in people today that will be the leaders tomorrow and ask what are the skills and competencies they need when they pop out on that far side, whether they end up in public sector, private sector is a moot point. And so through that understanding, um, we began working um, 10 years ago in an arena with what is now uh, 76 universities and 140 schools of public health, veterinary medicine, medical schools, schools of environment, and schools of nursing to fundamentally create um, an opportunity at the pre-service level for that next generation of leaders to have the core competencies that speak to their ability not only to understand problems from a multi-sectoral perspective, whether you're a vet or a physician, understanding that problems and solutions inherently require um, a much more complex way of looking at it, and using universities as the instrument to create that understanding and that insight. And so we've had the real privilege of entering into a partnership with these schools in Africa and in Asia, along with two really important U.S. universities, Minnesota, University of Minnesota and Tufts University, and their schools of public health, veterinary medicine, schools of environment, schools of nursing. And what was particularly thrilling about this partnership is that unlike much of the work that we do within AID, which is that we're exporting best practices and helping build the systems and capacities to institute those best practices, whether it's clinical diagnosis or management or whatever it might be. The United States also is struggling with these inherent issues around um, mm -hmm. emerging multi-sectoral disease threats. Mm -hmm. And we are also struggling with how we create a workforce that has that multi-sectoral <laughs> dimension. We are as stovepiped and unisectoral as any country on this planet. And so Tufts University and Minnesota University are also struggling with figuring out how they create their next generation of leaders for the United States. And so what we've ended up doing among these um, 76 universities uh, in Africa and Asia and our partners in the United States is a joint venture in sort of shared learning. That 
we have certain skills and our partners in uh, Asia and Africa have certain skills, but we're all bringing them together towards trying to understand how we create a uh, educational and learning experience that's inherently multi-sectoral. Minnesota and Tufts are taking those back to how they're doing their own training within their own institution. So it's one of these wonderfully mutually beneficial partnerships. This is not the vectors of development, in fact, are moving in both directions. Uh, and so it's a, an exquisitely um, uh, sort of wonderful example about how, in this case, development is a process that the United States is also engaged in. We are also in need of development uh, investments. And so this is one where we're learning from the universities in Ethiopia, uh, in Uganda, in Cameroon, in Senegal, in uh, Vietnam, in Indonesia, uh, in Cambodia, in Myanmar. So it's, it's what does that next generation of leaders need to look like? Well, they need to look the same in the United States as they do in Ethiopia. They need to have a intellectual resilience and problem-solving capability that allows them to speak a language across sectors that is uh, shared and it's impactful in terms of their ability to collectively say, we have a shared problem, we have shared solutions. So the partnership we have is a vibrant one that is fundamentally being led by these institutions in a way that is uh, allowing us to uh, solve problems we never could have solved before. Uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Dennis. That was, uh, you, you got up there. You got up. <laughs> uh, I, APLU just ran something called the Challenge of Change, which was we uh, brought 200 folks together, stakeholders and academics to, uh, address what could our universities do for global food security. And somebody at that, that stood up and said, the world has problems and universities have departments. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so we'll deal with this question and answer. <laughs> but that's a theme that I think is of, of, of great value. Uh, Takara Jones is working in the area with universities. Uh, uh, trying to tap into their expertise to try to look at what I guess I could call, is it fair to call it development science? Is that fair to we say? call it that. We can call it other things. We'll okay, discuss. you will call it other things. We'll so discuss. I'll let her clarify. But it's, it's a different twist that has, has uh, emerged with, with the Obama administration. And Takora? Sure, thank you. you. Um, I look out and I see all of these wonderful faces that I used to see around the halls of the Ronald Reagan building. And it's just like, oh, wait. Um, which means that I've been there long enough. We have, I haven't hit a decade yet, but we are well over um, five years. And um, while I might not have the gray, I, I feel like the, the organization has aged me in a way that... <laughs> On some days, it's incredibly valuable because, you know, you see things and you feel like you have seen them before. And on other days, you just want to go home and go to sleep. But thank you all for all of your service. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with each one of you. And thank each of you for your comments on this panel. Um, as Dennis said, you set a very low bar, Dr. Dennis. Very low, very low. <laughs> but your, your, um, your story and the inspiration within that story is, is part of what I think motivates a lot of the work that happens within the Center for Development Research. So I am in the US Global Development Lab, that upstart organization that started about three, four years ago. Um, but before that, it was the Office of Science and Technology and the Innovation Development Alliance's office. And so depending on when you retire, that might be what you are familiar with in, in terms of these, these upstart people who are like, what, Sci what? what are you doing? Um, and, and, and within it, I think part of what we originally wanted to help reinvigorate was um, the ability for us to find ways to support all of the different ways science and research and technology were happening around the agency. Dennis is but one person with a fabulous program, but how can we make sure that there are more 
who can do the kinds of things that he's doing in this kind of transdisciplinary way, um, who can support the, the types of multidisciplinary work that can happen um, when you are working to build a global, si global citizenry that is focused on um, science and research and education and ultimately having impact within, within the world. You know, the Center for Development Research is focused primarily on finding ways to help us as an agency drive research to impact. And the ways that we do that within the center, the small ways that we do that within the center, are looking for ways that we can support developing country researchers. Um, oh, what is, what is happening? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a ring I'm familiar with. Um, um, ways that we can support local researchers who have partnerships with US-based researchers like we have through the PEER program. So that's the Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement and Research. And I actually just came from a forum. You know, we are, we are marching into year seven of that program, year seven of 10, and ultimately have supported 250 developing country researchers to the tune of leveraging about $440 million within the US. And so finding ways that we are, are building active partnerships so that we're not having a conversation about brain drain, but brain circulation, is kind of an evolution of kind of where you have come from, Dr. Ajeta, into a space where people are able to access the opportunities and partnerships to advance their human capacity and their institutional capacity from um, home countries while still building partnerships with the global citizenry of kind of the scientific community that, that is. Um, and we think that that's been incredibly important because one of the challenges that I have seen within the US higher education community sometimes is like, oh, we did this research, we published this paper, we're done. Or we did this research and I have a cook stove and we're done. And I used to have people walk up to me and tell me after I would talk at a university and tell me that they they built a cook stove. But I'm just like, I don't care. <laughs> because what does that mean? You know, you created something, but how have you worked with a community? How have you worked in partnership? How have you built the capacity of some plus someone else? Or are you just kind of doing an interesting vanity project so that you can, what, why? And so challenging, continuing to challenge the higher education community globally to think about why and to think about who they're influencing and why they are trying to make that influence and how to translate their work so it's actually intelligible to other people. Um, is something that I, I think is incredibly important. Um, when we started the Higher Education Solutions Network five years ago now, actually, hmm, our five-year anniversary will be coming up in like three days. Um, no, we are not having a party. We had that already. <laughs> but when we, when we started it, part of what we were trying to address was some of these interdisciplinary ways that universities were working, but we weren't necessarily, we didn't necessarily have access to. Dennis gave great examples of, you know, kind of pandemic health threats and kind of how the public health system had dealt in trying to build community there. But what about geospatial information and data? What about social entrepreneurship? What about um, different ways to look at digital development and how that was ultimately impacting the work that we did? And so when we put a call out, we really were looking for people who were trying to work in a multidisciplinary way, but also had robust communities that they were working with around the world. They didn't have to be US institutions, um, but looking for people who already had relationships with government, relationships with communities, relationships with so small and growing businesses, so that the work that, that might have been happening within a university had a place to go, and so that we could find ways to learn lessons about how to more effectively translate the research that might be happening within a higher education institution into action and practice um, in these interstitial, inter, interdisciplinary spaces um, that might be on the outside. Um, our, one of our former administrators, um, Raj Shah, came back from a trip to California and he was at the University of California, Berkeley. They have a global poverty practice minor that is the most oversubscribed minor within the campus. They have about 500 students a year that show up for this minor. So the work that you all are doing, people think it's awesome now, <laughs> and not just in a, I'm gonna go to Peace Corps kind of way, but in a, oh wait, I can use my computer science to actually help something happen in the developing world kind of way. Um, and he came back and he was like, I see the future and we're not in it if we're not finding ways to engage with these kinds of communities. 
So ultimately, um, what I believe we have been able to build is an, a different kinds of ways of studying how you can more effectively work uh, from a university perspective to build human capacity um, in communities, with other campuses, and with governments. Um, this has happened, uh, but also in how we work with USAID. Uh, one great example that's just happened recently is the partnership between Food for Peace and our Comprehensive Initiative for Technology Evaluation at MIT. Um, one thing that you all know is that <coughs> waste from food aid is, is a big problem. But how do you actually get at that? How do you um, create a research question around that that can actually be studied so you've got a solution on the other end? Ultimately, what they did was essentially follow the food aid in different packaging around the world. You're not going to get an implementing partner to do that. You can get a graduate student to do it, though. <laughs> and, and that graduate student followed the food aid in multiple different packaging, looking at spoilage, wastage, you know, whether things were um, becoming human, all of these other different factors, from Des Moines to Djibouti. They followed it all the way through, and at the end, unlike some other research questions, the food aid was actually still able to be distributed because it was part of a broader system that we partnered together. And at, at the end of that, we hope to be able to save potentially millions of dollars a year on food aid packaging because it was a question that our partners in Food for Peace were interested in, posed to a university who is very interested in answering that question. And how do we find more ways to actually make those kinds of connections happen so that um, you are building the next generation of professionals who are proficient in the kinds of problems that are, are development challenges or are, are implementation challenges? How do you make sure you do that? So I think that there's, there's so much that's happened within all of the programs that are within the Center for Development Research. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the human and institutional capacity that we are able to build through our programs is something that I think will be on the cutting edge of who can be transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, who can translate between um, what is actually happening in research and what is happening in policy. Because you cannot expect that to be a single person. You know, for me to expect that you as former mission directors will understand a research paper that somebody spent multiple years on isn't fair. <laughs> and for me to expect that that researcher can translate their work immediately to the needs of a mission director also isn't fair. So we need people in the interstitial spaces that help move that along to get research to impact much more effectively, which I hope we've been able to do and, and continue to advance um, through the Center for Development Research. Thank you. Well, very good. <laughs> Let me, we're going to pose a few quick questions, but we've, we're, we're a little behind on time, so we want to stay, we have till quarter of, correct? Yeah. Uh, Kabisa, Ethiopia, as an example, has put a considerable amount of resources into university development. Um, what, is there a role, for instance, is there a role for USAID in the higher education space in Ethiopia? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, let me use a couple of examples that I'm familiar with and make a point about both the institutional strengthening notion as well as the human capacity building. I think investments such as what you described earlier um, that um, the Point Four program invested in, in Ethiopia and building Oklahoma State University as well as University of the Sosa uh, in Brazil, two institutions I'm very familiar with through my connection at Purdue, um, are extremely important um, uh, because of uh, the investment is not only just building an institution, but it's a cultural change that is extremely critical. And that uh, cultural change need to have, go through experiential learning through generations of professionals, as it did in Brazil, as it did in Ethiopia. Uh, in, in Ethiopia's case, it got disrupted by uh, government change, uh, civil war, and, and, and so on over the years. But the irony is that even through that, 
among all the institutions that we have in Ethiopia today, higher education institutions, <laughs> out of my university that was at in Oklahoma State University, is still the premier university as a result of that culture, residual culture that have retained, mm -hmm. that have been retained in, in the system. But, but I think the point you're getting at, um, Tag, is the fact that the demand for higher education has really increased significantly. You know, when I was uh, a young kid, any, any young person that has, an, that has a desire to get an education somehow, uh, particularly advanced education, would get it because there were very few of us and um, most of us got opportunities to go and study abroad. But now, uh, just using Ethiopia as an example, in the last 15 years, Ethiopia has gone from four universities to over 42, 44 universities today. And on the positive side, more and more of poor kids from rural Ethiopia are getting an opportunity to go to college. But at the same time, the quality of that, uh, that education had gone down. And there is no, people are getting certificates or finishing school, and the notion that people get a job because they have diplomas, not necessarily skill sets. And so many of the kids that are being trained don't have the skill set that employers require. When the primary employer was the Ethiopian government, uh, people get jobs and somehow struggle through that. And now there are private opportunities that are coming up and they're a lot more discriminating about the kind of people that they want to hire. So Ethiopia is not alone by itself. That all over Africa, the two prominent things that have changed in the last 20, 15 years are really expansion in higher education and expansion in infrastructure development. And through this higher education expansion, there is a huge need for uh, strengthening these institutions. Um, through some mode, and whether it is old sister university concept that we had with Oklahoma working with uh, Harama University or Purdue working with Visosa or some other center of excellence concept, there is an absolute need to, to, to bring about new culture and leapfrog the painful experience that these institutions are going through and then in the process produce so many graduates that are ill-qualified for the job, and these are the, going to be the future leaders of the country, and, 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 and having these kinds of people in those positions is not good for anybody, and for the country as well as for others. Uh, this also goes with the private sector, but this idea of you know, helping them build themselves, strengthen themselves through some kind of partnership is is absolutely necessary. And the other dimension I want to talk about is the human capacity building and the, the training of leaders in many of these places. I really truly believe still there is room for many of these people to send their best and brightest to some places like the United States to get great, great education. I may be biased because I got my education here, but I really believe that American higher education, particularly at the graduate level, is really par excellence uh, in terms of the exposure our graduate students get, in terms of the mindset of American professors as opposed to professors somewhere else, in getting your hands dirty and working together and sharing knowledge and, and being open with the students and so on. And you know, last week, in about two weeks ago, we celebrated uh, uh, a new World Food Laureate at, uh, at Des Moines, and he, was, he is now president of the African Development Bank. He was a student at Purdue. I was on his graduate committee. A, br <laughs> a brilliant individual, but that had gotten this really great education, has natural leadership ability, but built upon by, catalyzed by, by his experience at Purdue University. And, and, I, and I'll add one more. Um, and, and this is a hearsay that I heard, and I, I was delighted to hear this. Some of you may know Ed Shu, a university, earlier at Purdue, and then at Purdue University. Ed had an, a, a young graduate student when he was at Purdue from, from Brazil. And 
he had worked with him very closely. But this guy was totally smitten, really enamored by the land-grant university principle that Ed Shu had imparted on this young man. And so Ed Shu had been work, going in and out of Brazil and working with, through the University of Vizosa earlier, but had this person that he brought up and worked, in, and this person is finishing his graduate degree and going back to Brazil. And this young man had the wherewithal at the time to go and speak to some of the leadership in Brazil. And at the time, he had some connection with the government he went to and spoke to them. And he said that if you really want to transform Brazilian agriculture once and for all, you really need to adopt the land-grant university model of the US, USA, uh, the US government, the US universities. But it needs to start with an aggressive campaign on human capacity development. And so on, as it turned out, on the advisement, this young person who had just returned with a fresh PhD to, to Brazil, actually the military government of Brazil at the time accepted his advice, went to the World Bank, took a loan to send out 10,000 Brazilians to create Embrapa, the organization now is the engine of change in, in, in Brazil. So this, those 10, Purdue University was involved in working through the logistics for them for sending out these 10,000. I was a graduate student at the time at Purdue. And so 10,000 students went back to create the miracle that it is that America and Brazilian agriculture today. So human capacity building is the foundation for agricultural transformation. And very often, if you don't do that, you continue to send out projects instead of program, projects to developing countries. It's really putting the cart in front of the horse. Okay, can I? Yeah, sure. And to this question of culture, just a very kind of microcosm example of this, uh, the Resilient African Network is one of the higher education solution network campuses that's located at Macquarie University in Kampala. And originally we had been working with the School of Public Health who had been working with the One Health program. But what they ended up doing was partnering with Stanford University to start thinking about how they could integrate more human-centered design kinds of principles into their work so that you know the kid who went to school at Macquarie could also find ways to build social ventures, uh, work more effectively with their communities, and have their um, technical degrees actually have more immediate relevance. And what was really interesting about that cultural change is that it started, it, it, it has started very much as an extracurricular change. So instead of it being a top-down or a bottom-up kind of from the students, it started as an extracurricular change that the um, Resilient African Network brought in, starting to use some of Stanford's kinds of methodologies, adapting them for themselves, but then also going out and training other African campuses on how to use these kinds of tools. Uh, one of the AAAS fellows who used to work for me, who actually went to Purdue, well, he came to Purdue uh, for a minute, Alex Moseson, um, thought about student engagement that we have here in the US and um, came up with this idea to have like a movie night and have it happen at all of our campuses. We were just like, what, why? So we just, we let him proceed with this idea. Um, it didn't take off with the US campuses, but it actually took off at the Ugandan campus because it was yet another way to bring students to campus to show them the resources that were there as they were building up kind of innovation, knowledge and practice how to work within communities, but essentially helped start building a more um, cohesive community around how their work might have community impact. And that kind of very tangible cultural change then led to um, one of the students who I think will be graduating shortly, you know, they had integrated this kind of big ideas competition that was more of a startup-ish kind of, you know, you build your idea, you get a little bit of money, you are able to proceed forward. Um, they had integrated some of this from the Berkeley campus because we're, we're expecting people to share their tools and resources. And this young woman who had come to movie night and then come to some of the other pitch competitions, you know, she, she 
she got herself integrated within the community and then created something called Pedal Tap, which essentially, you know, we can walk into our bathrooms here, you stick your hand under the sink and it will automatically work. If you don't have a lot of electricity, that's not gonna work, but she essentially remodified like bicycle brakes so that you could use a pedal in any sink to make that same kind of technology work. She won um, kind of an honorable mention, like small prize with the Berkeley competition first. And then she came, she came back, kept iterating on that idea, building teams, you know, working on that and continuing to build. And then she won $15,000 with another competition that she went to, and I never remember what the middle competition is. But she most recently, from a Johnson & Johnson venture competition, won $100,000. And like, this is a young Ugandan innovator who is a finishing student at McCary University, who if not for that culture change, that kind of worked its way in, not necessarily from a kind of traditional curricular way up, but worked its way in, this would not have happened. And I think she was also inspired by another young Ugandan innovator who was working on different ways to diagnose malaria, who has also, um, he essentially is creating his own small global health company in Kampala. So how do you, that, that culture change that you're talking about, it's very mm -hmm. real, it's very tangible. But seeing that, inf seeing that um, infect is not the word I want to use, but it's the word that I'm going to use right now, um, how students in multiple kinds of university settings, seeing how it impacts their thinking on what they can do mm -hmm. is incredibly powerful. And I'm, I'm excited to see who they're going to be as they continue to age um, and get further training or go on to build larger ventures. That's an interesting point, in the, in, in going back to, um, I'm sure you all remember the ATLAS program, and it was participatory training, trained thousands of uh, students, um, primarily in the United States. Um, but one of, when they evaluated the ATLAS program, it, they, were not, uh, they, they were impressed with the technical skills that the students had learned. This was graduate training. But the most important thing was the cultural the change in, in the attitudes of students about science, about teamwork, about deadlines, about, you know, it, it just out there, there. And so getting students, not necessarily to the United States, but getting the students out of their own environment into another environment expands their thinking. Dennis, a question for you. Uh, this idea of USAID functioning as a convener of a, of this, this is a very <coughs> powerful idea. Um, what are, what are the, the challenges that you face institutionally in doing this? And is this something that is going to be in the future of USAID and other areas? I mean, just to be clear, did you say a convener? Could well, you just elaborate on that? Just well, yeah, no, I use that because that was a, a, a word used in the previous uh, panel. Uh, the idea that you have basically constructed a large problem and you've said, okay, what are the elements that need to come together to, to bring this to a solution? And <coughs> you're using your stakeholders as a kind of cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary team to address this, but you're you're at the center of this. Yeah. And 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 is this when we think about the kind of challenges we have in development, is this a model that perhaps should be expanded, uh, you know, or, or not? What are the challenges in doing that? Okay. I mean, first off, it, 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 this partnership we have under One Health uh, Workforce uh, builds upon an earlier partnership that was also um, based on convening around mm -hmm. certain shared uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. And that was very much focused on a public health partnership within uh, East and Central Africa. And it was a, a recognition that anyone who went into take the country of your choice uh, in Africa and you looked at who the leadership was, uh, both at the central ministry but at the provincial and the district uh, ministries, it was always a physician. Mm -hmm. And the physician always had the responsibility for managing the events within their purview, within the province or within the district. And managing that was about human resources. It was about budget. It was about planning. 
none of which they learned when they were mm -hmm. being trained as clinicians. <laughs> so we frequently found the biggest single problem was a mix, mismatch of skill sets, that they did not have fundamental public administration <laughs> skills, which is really what they needed to have. Sounds uh, like university administrators. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we established a partnership in East and Central Africa. First, it, it, first around, it was a leadership program mm. that we brought together uh, schools of um, Columbia uh, School of Public Administration, um, George Washington Business, and Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health in partnership with, again, uh, there were eight uh, schools of public health in East and Central Africa, essentially to build into their curriculum platform, opportunities for clinicians as part of their training to actually to learn the skills of administration. Mm -hmm. um, but it was in 2005 or 2000, no, 2009, as we were being challenged with uh, the lack of proper skill sets um, around this issue about multi-sectoralism and health, we went back to those same partners and said, would you like to broaden the gauge? Would you like to invite beyond the School of Public Health? And would you like to channel this? So we used that as a springboard and then took it to uh, Asia. But the most fundamental um, sort of point was that what we were talking about was areas that were understood to be of high mutual interest. Mm -hmm. So it was not bringing a good idea what it was was identifying a shared idea that was a high priority and then building the execution around that idea. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we found that was the most exciting when we talked about U.S. institutions being involved, what was really perceived as the most important contribution to U.S. institutions was the whole area of experiential teaching. Mm -hmm. that both the, 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 we worked at the dean level, and the deans and their faculty over and over again pointed out that their educational experience and how they taught was very much, both in Asia and Africa, didactic education, mm -hmm. right, by rote. And they understood that as a fundamentally flawed approach, certainly towards creating inquiring minds and mm -hmm. you know, problem-solving skills. And so the biggest single attribute that the Tufts and Minnesota brings isn't so much their technical skills, it's their teaching modality. Mm -hmm. So one part of our portfolio is creating a retraining of the faculty. How do they think mm -hmm. and how do they teach? And then how do you create a curriculum which is fundamentally experiential? That said, sure, I mean, you know, there is when we think about the future and we think about Africa, we think about Asia, we think about Latin America, we think about anywhere, the world is evolving very rapidly in directions that our schools are not necessarily keeping pace with. So anything we can do to put into place sort of an experiential problem solving approach mm -hmm. that is looking across time horizons, it's not just what's the problem of today, but it's also paying attention to those trends that have a predictability about, we know population, population pressures, we know economic growth and economic consequences. Mm -hmm. What do those mean for 2030, 2050? Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's making sure that we understand not just what the present challenges are, what the future challenges are, and that we build a resilience into the educational model that allows it to be organic with respect to meeting this, forecasting and meeting those challenges. Excellent, excellent. Could I open this up to the audience? Yep. Do we have a... We don't need a, maybe we don't need a microphone. This is a Say it loudly. Hopefully it will be short. Yeah, you do. For the people in the back, they will. Yeah. Yeah. AID does a lot of things, and, and we're hearing some about it now. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer with uh, Global Health, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that Global Health has done over the last, let's say, 20 years. Uh, I've been out of AID for 10. 
Uh, there's been a lot of progress made. AID does lots of other things in agriculture and infrastructure and many different things. I am reminded by this panel, though, and particularly by the doctor sitting up here, even before I left AID, the participant training program was starting to diminish. And I haven't looked into it, but I think it's probably still going that way. So what I'd like to do is make, this is not a question, it's a suggestion to the USAID Alumni Association. And it is that the Alumni Association, with the connections that they have now in the present administration, it's too bad that Mark Green wasn't here, and the Congress, somebody invite this gentleman <laughs> and send him up to the Congress and send him into Mark Green's office and have him play that tape that he just did this morning. And let's get the participant training program back going again. Dennis? I'd like to follow up a little bit more specifically on that very good question, I think. And my, my question really to you, that, that work particularly with those on the Hill, is given, Tag, you were talking, Dennis Weller, uh, I just retired from Ethiopia uh, last year, so we've got a, a few things in common with the panel up here. But the question is, what are you hearing on the Hill? If, if, if university partnerships are such an important asset of ours, uh, the United States, what, what are the real barriers to, to Congress and the administration, and a, not, notwithstanding the, the innovation labs that have, have increased and the, the work on the One Health, what are the real barriers to actually increasing the demand for more of these kind of programs, particularly by Congress who funds us, uh, sort of thing, and why can't we get more oomph out of, uh, uh, Dr. Kabiza, your, your, your sort of story out there? Uh, and you're up on the Hill quite a bit, so I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Um, well, uh, on the Hill, frankly, there's, you get good support. Um, I think uh, there is a tension, frankly, in the education uh, portfolio between, unfortunately, basic education and higher education. Basic education ha is funded at a fairly high level, close to about a billion dollars a year. Um, and that's a... a no one is against basic education. Uh, the question uh, and the argument we make is that basic education producing a lot of people who frankly want to go to higher education and higher education is having a very difficult time accepting it. Um, and if you don't think of education as a pipeline, then uh, you lose the power of education. You can't run a country on an eighth grade education or at least run it well. And, and uh, so there's a lot of, there's a, there's a fair amount of, of uh, support for that on the Hill. Uh, where there isn't support, frankly, is, is within the agency. And uh, we've talked to the agency <coughs> quite a bit about this. And, and uh, they're very interested in working with higher education to do some of the things that Decora and Dennis have talked about here as being partners. Um, the question is whether or not there's the the uh, there's not the support for the what are thought to be the old partnership programs that build institutions and that kind of commitment. And uh, the question is what kinds of new models can emerge that are acceptable uh, for building institutional capacity. And that's a uh, that's something that we've tried to discuss with the agency uh, at large, but. Um, it's a work in progress. May I? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think the, there's definitely the recognition that the human and institutional capacity development elements are, are critical to that. But kind of the, the, the tension, as Tag was talking about, is also a timing tension. And so, you know, how long does it take to do participatory training? And those of us who are in the programming spaces are being given compressed timelines mm -hmm. and higher expectations. So if you'd like to talk to people about how to extend those timelines and think, you know, long-term horizon, like that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I th it took me five years to finish a PhD. Like that's what it takes. <laughs> um, it takes two to three years to finish a master's. It takes four, year four to five years to get through undergrad. And when, when you have that longer-term commitment, it makes it much easier to plan around those kinds of things. 
And when the timeline commitment is uncertain from a wide variety of levels, you then figure out how to program within the timeline horizon you feel like you, you are authorized to live within. In the back? The very practical point from is uh. it, how do you how do we support things that are fundamental to development but that are long term and their impact is diffuse? Uh -huh. How do you measure the impact of a PhD? Well, if you look at a person for thirty years, you can measure that impact. Um, the problem is that often um, you, programs be you know within the metrics environment, uh, you can you become what you can measure. And, and that's tag, a real tag. Yeah. Uh, just for the benefit of the, the two people that asked the question, let me say briefly yeah. this. When I joined the BIFAD board, the day that we were sworn in, uh, Dr. Shah, whom I knew, I've worked with before, served as an advisor to him for a year before being appointed to BIFAD board, knew where I stood with this agenda. I indicated to the board if this board would look at this agenda, of HICD and gave me a recommendation, I'll find a path to it. And we, we took that, I was designated a chair on the subcommittee on the BIFAD. We did a study, we commissioned a study and worked with APLU, put together uh, an analysis of where we stood, where, 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 where things were, where, where they are now along the path that you described. Uh, and, and the unfortunate part is, um, you know, it didn't find a path within the agency to move out of the agency to, to where support could be asked for through. Uh, there was, there was a, a, it was raised when the Food Security Act was being considered, but, but attacking it at that stage didn't make sense and it wasn't done. But so, there is serious understanding and appreciation, even within the agency, about the need there, but somehow it, it hung up there. I just wanted to, to say that. One a couple of uh, follow-ons. Um, uh, I served in Brazil twice, uh, 20 years apart, and when I went back the second time, uh, I looked at, talked to people from the institutions we had been supporting uh, in my first, when I was there as a first tour. And they weren't all university to university programs. Some of these, we had a program with the fire service, uh, USDA's fire service here with the Brazilian fire service. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a guy uh, in the second round and said, well, you know, you, you have any st contacts still with the forest service? He said, yeah, I go back every four or five years to Montana where the guy who trained me is, and I go back there and I get all the manuals I get the new manuals, I get the materials, and I get some equipment, and I carry it back to Brazil, and I use it for training, I translate it into Portuguese, and I use it for training there. And these programs have continued over the years. For the university to university programs, there are many different changes than what we had in those days. And one of them is, I, I would like to question uh, the university folks here, uh, what uh, incentives are for a senior professor or a middle level professor to go overseas on an aid contract. In terms of tenuring, I think it used to not be a negative uh, to do that. I'm wondering now that it may be a negative for someone to leave the university for two or three years uh, as you, they look at their tenure track. I can start with that one. Yeah. I think it very much depends on the character of the university. Um, as we've seen a number of universities continue to think about their internationalization, not just in the context of uh, Europe and China, um, but in terms of how they actually address global development. Um, there, there continues to be an, an ongoing conversation about how that feeds into how the universities see themselves and want to portray themselves in the broader world. Um, well, two, big, two examples that I have of that are um, the, aid, the College of William and Mary and um, the work that they, they've done through the Aid Data Center for Development Policy, which has been highlighted recently around kind of China's, China's influence in Africa. If you've seen that kind of floating about, that came from um, College of William and Mary and the University of California, Berkeley. Um, it, it is a challenge, um, especially if people are trying to build 
the kinds of multidisciplinary departments that are focused around global poverty um, and how to address that uh, to find ways to legitimize these kinds of approaches. One of the things that did happen within the midterm evaluation that we had for HESN is that because we had US universities kind of very focused on some of these issues, it did help to legitimize these kinds of approaches, working on global poverty, working in countries that aren't the glamorous countries uh, to, to move, to, to help universities move in that direction. But there does have to be commitment from the leadership of those institutions to be able to support that, not just for the senior professors who have, fa have tenure, but for the junior professors who are moving along that faculty track, as well as research associates who are present. So more and more of them are actually setting up centers that incorporate development practitioners as well as researchers to be able to kind of build some of those bridges. Because if you have someone who's a development practitioner who might have come from one of our former implementing partners, um, who's there to kind of massage the country to country relationships, and then they're bringing in the faculty and professors to, to some of those other relationships and helping, helping them move those things along, you're not just counting on the ability of that singular professor to be able to make those relationships work, but ultimately have impact either. So the ways in which universities are bringing together different types of people around these issues, I think, continues to evolve. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to stop for lunch, no. but I just one concluding comment here on, on this point. Um, Decora has both identified some of the incentive structures within USAID that impose itself on development, and the question was about the same sort of incentive structure within universities. And that's one of the big challenges, frankly, to the kind of work that Dennis is doing, uh, the kind of work that, that Gabisa would like to see, is how do we change the incentive structure uh, within our organizations so that we can do the things that are actually fundamental to development. Nobody argues against human capital, but if USAID can't do real human capital development because of the incentive structure, then the question is how do you change the incentive structure? And if universities can't participate fully in development because of their incentive structures, how do we change our university structure? And I think those are challenges frankly, a great challenge for you from the, uh, and a great challenge for us at APLU. And that's what, why we, we uh, uh, titled our food security report, The Challenge of Change. Great. So, thank you. Thank you, all of you, Tag, and all, for another wonderful and probing uh, discussion. We really, really appreciate it. And, and maybe if there, folks have some questions, if you might stick around for a little while, they, they may, uh, come up to you. I'm afraid that the grumbling stomachs, rumbling stomachs might <laughs> overpower right now. So we need to, we need to break for lunch. Um, I, uh, lunch uh, is uh, across that, is that there? Oh, sorry. It's this way. <laughs> Follow the aroma. And um, please don't forget, if you want to put forward a question for the administrator, um, there are uh, three by five cards out where the handouts are and write out your question and give it either to George Ingram if you know him or oh, a box for it now just drop it in the box and one o'clock okay so back here by two all right but but our next our next uh, program starts at two o'clock so please be in the seats by then okay thank you